Yeah. And you will, because we're all for us. I treat a day because if you go late, it's Kevin, we're live. <laughs> Yeah, we'll call this meeting of the Joint Minerals Committee to, to order. And the first order of business is roll call. Please. Senator Beitman. Here. Senator Cooper. Here. Senator Rothfuss. Here. Senator Wasserberger. Here. Representative Baer. Here. Representative Burkhart. Here. Representative Duncan. Here. Representative Ayer. Here. Representative Gray. Excuse me. Representative Heiner. Here. Representative Sherwood. Here. Representative Western. Here. Co-Chairman Anderson. Here. Co-Chairman Greer. Here. Mr. Chairman, you have a quorum. Wonderful. Then we can conduct business. Wonderful. Uh, we have a special guy to introduce today. Uh, he's now the in or going to be the interim supervisor for the Bombing Oil and Gas Commission. Uh, he's been with the commission for 11 years, been the deputy for seven years, so he's quite capable of stepping in and, and taking over after July 6th. So, Tom Kropatch, would you please stand and be recognized? So, the first order of business is the uh, School of Energy Resources, and I think Squat. Scott Quinlan did make it. Introduce yourself and, and abide all the rules. <laughs> Good morning, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. <laughs> My name is Scott Quinlan. I'm the Senior Director of Research for the School of Energy Resources uh, for the University of Wyoming. And I do have some slides this morning. So I hope these slides can be brought up on the screen. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so Mr. Chairman, um, here at School of Energy Resources, we are very mission driven. We're laser, laser focused on that mission, uh, which is energy driven economic development for the state of Wyoming. For the folks on the committee that aren't as familiar with the School of Energy Resources, um, you should look at us like a hub for energy, academic outreach, and research on the campus University of Wyoming. We're funded separately from the university, and, and that is by design. It's to increase our reach and our impact across campus. Uh, we have 10 different faculty members. They're located in seven different departments around campus, and we're often called the gateway for industry. So I just wanted to provide that little bit of background on the School of Energy Resources. Next slide, please. This morning, I'm gonna talk about three topics. First is the importance of carbon capture uh, for our state and for our nation. Second, I'd like to just identify some other projects that we're working on, on carbon capture and storage at the School of Energy Resources. And then I'm privileged and excited to give you an update on the Wyoming Carbon Safe Project. Next slide, please. And next slide. Mr. Chairman, if you examine the image on the left, it shows a polygon, a yellow polygon placed over the Powder River Basin in Wyoming. And it places thumbtacks across the United States where Powder River Basin coal is shipped. If you look at the image on the right, that provides a heat map of the carbon emissions across the United States. It doesn't take very much study to realize that a lot of those carbon emissions are tied to Powder River Basin coal. But what I'd like to point out is almost underneath every one of those emissions that's shown on the image on the right in crosshatch is the potential for saline aquifer storage. That is the potential to capture carbon dioxide from those point source emissions and store it on site. Next slide, please. Carbon capture and storage goes way beyond coal. Uh, we've been looking at carbon capture and storage from coal, as coal is so important to Wyoming. 
but it's so much it, decarbonization of all industries relies on carbon capture and storage. There's a lot of other industries in Wyoming that emit carbon emissions, natural gas processing, Trona, oil and gas refining, cement production. If we fuel switch to natural gas fired electricity, that's also going to be uh, need carbon capture and storage. There's new industries that we could bring to Wyoming that will depend on carbon capture and storage. For example, blue hydrogen production. We have the ability to take coal and natural gas and turn it into hydrogen if we can capture and store those carbon dioxide emissions. So a, a new industry on hydrogen will stand on the shoulders of carbon capture and storage. Soon we'll begin hearing about new projects on direct air capture and carbon removal. Those are looking hard at Wyoming just because we're so far ahead in carbon capture and storage. So there's an opportunity to bring new industries to Wyoming. I also want to point out that a lot of a lot of industries are fuel switching from coal to natural gas. They did it one because of to, because of cost, but two to be carbon competitive. If you burn natural gas instead of coal, you emit about half of the carbon emissions. But now there's something out there called 45Q. And there are goals to decarbonize your entire industry. So you're being asked to not just cut your emissions in half, but to go to zero. So I think a lot of utilities out there, a lot of industries are saying, hey, wait a minute. We switched to natural gas so we could be half of the carbon emissions. But now you're telling us we have to go all the way to zero. Industries are now starting to think, wait a minute, we can leapfrog the switch to natural gas and we can capture carbon dioxide from coal much cheaper. And with 45Q, we get a lot more in tax credits for the more CO2 we, we emit. So I think in the next few years, instead of seeing fuel switching, we'll see straight carbon capture uh, being applied to coal-fired power. Next slide, please. Scott, what's Mr. that uh, picture on the left there? It looks like a pipe or something with, what's that? Mr. Chairman, that is core that we collected from Dry Forks Power Station uh, on a stratigraphic test well that we drilled in 2019. Next slide, please. And one more. Thank you. Before I update you on the Wyoming Carbon Safe Project, I want the committee to, to know that we have a lot of other research projects around carbon capture and storage that we're working on. We are part of the Plain CO2 Reduction Partnership. Uh, this is led by the University of North Dakota Energy and Environmental Research Center. We're also partnered with uh, University of Alaska on that. Those are three states that are fossil dependent. We have over 200 industry partners and the whole goal of that program is to commercialize carbon capture and storage. Number two, the flameless pressurized oxy combustion. This committee is well known or knows that project well. The FPO, we call it. It's a new combustion technology that combines the combustion of fossil fuels in the presence of pure oxygen and pressure to emit only a pure stream of CO2, which makes capture very easy. This is, could be a next generation combustion technology for coal, natural gas, and biomass. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Representative Burkhardt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Scott, <clears throat> where do we stand on the FPO project? I know the DOE declined to uh, fund that research. Uh, any update on, on where we're going with that? Mr. Chairman, Representative Burkhardt. You're correct. That proposal was not funded by the Department of Energy. So we are pulled back, we're regrouping uh, and looking for strategic ways that we can get that uh, project funded and, and out to commercialization. Uh, we're looking at paths both for private and Mr. Representative Burkhart, to be honest, in this new administration, they're not going to fund new coal combustion projects. So we've got to look for um, state and private investment to move that project forward. Scott, is that retrofitable to a current uh, power plant or does it have to be a new installation? Senator Anderson, it is, uh, it's kind of a hybrid. So it's not really a post bolt on at the end. It's something that goes on in the front. So you would um, concentrate the oxygen 
and then you can combust it that way. But it could be installed at, at current locations. Hmm. Oh, yes. Thank you, Mr. Good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So how far along are we in this research to be able to, um, is it just lack of funding or are we still in the research phase? How far are we into this to be able to make it um, to fruition? Mr. Chairman, Representative Duncan, it's ready for demonstration. It's, it's out of the lab. It's been pilot tested overseas. It's ready to be deployed at demonstration scale uh, here in the United States. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So what do you need from us? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman, Representative Duncan, uh, we'll take all the support we can get to move that project um, to demonstration. Mr. Chairman. Yeah. <clears throat> Maybe for, for the full committee, Scott, if you could just um, just give us a little bit of background on that. And again, the appropriation. Uh, with the idea that we were going to get significant, it was like 12 to one DOE matches that you do have a private partnership with Black Hills Energy, I believe. Um, and so this is a good question from the committee is, is a little more state support needed? Where are we? What negotiation? Yeah, I know you can't talk about every negotiation, but we're just a little history on it, please. Yeah, Mr. Chairman. So that's a, we're looking at about $110 million project. We do have significant private interest and those negotiations are ongoing. At some point, um, it, it, we don't have visibility on what the role the state could play, um, but there is 12 million that was appropriated for cost share for the DOE project. It's a very real possibility that that 12 million could be put to work to move this uh, technology to demonstration. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to draw your attention to the third bullet there, the Wyoming Carbon Underground Storage Project. This was a project that was started nearly a decade ago. We drilled a well at the Rock Springs Uplift, fully characterized the Rock Springs Uplift for geologic storage potential. Ten years ago, it was a research project. Today, it's a real commercial reality. The Rock Springs Uplift has the potential to store 25 billion tons of CO2, billion tons. That's over 400 years worth of all of Wyoming's emissions. If we could capture them all, ship them to the Rock Strings Uplift, put them down whole in those formations, we would still have excess capacity. The Rock Springs Uplift could be a large regional storage hub for the state of Wyoming. It sits Mr. directly below. Question, question. Representative Burkhart. Scott, sorry to interrupt your presentation, but so with the, the underground storage project, why aren't we using it commercially right now? What are the holdups? What do we need to do about them? I mean, if it's there, it's proven itself. Uh, why aren't we currently using it? Why isn't a company out there uh, selling their wares, so to speak? Right. So Mr. Chairman, Representative Burkhart, I do believe that there's a lot of private uh, interest in it right now working on just that. Well, Scott, one of the problems is you've got to capture that CO2 from the stack or wherever you're going to get it from to put it in the hole. And we don't have that leg put in there yet. We don't want to just sequester CO2. We want to capture the stack, don't we? Mr. Chairman, you're absolutely right. The capture component uh, needs to be put in place. I would make the observation that the Rock Springs uplift is, lies directly below the Jim Bridger power plant. It lies directly below other industries like Simplot's fertilizer plant. It's a stone throws away from the Wyoming Trota industry. It also is just miles from the CO2 pipeline that's currently in place. So CO2 could be captured elsewhere and, and brought to the Rock Springs uplift. Carbon capture could be installed on any of those industries that I mentioned and, and stored there. It's got that CO2 lines going the other way though, isn't it? Isn't it servicing the Salt Creek field and the Bell field? Mr. Chairman, uh, there's a, a spur off that line that goes down to Rangeley, Colorado. Oh. that runs within 10 miles of the Rock Springs uplift. Oh, oh. Mr. Chairman. Yep. Yes. <clears throat> on, on that point, it's for the committee is 
when this research was done, it was all modeled. Senator Rothfuss was here when we saw all that. The fact of the matter was we couldn't afford the CO2 to inject in to finish the testing because CO2 became such a valuable commodity in enhanced oil recovery. And I and Denver had developed that resource and pipeline. Um, so, you know, that, that this work was done, I guess, been 10 years um, yeah. and is sitting there and it was good work, good research, and now it becomes relevant. So just sort of um, a place marker that research is good, data is good, hold on to it. Mr. Chairman, thank you for that observation. Wouldn't you agree? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman? Yes. Oh, Mr. Senator Cooper. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Scott, what, what formation are you going into in the Rock Springs uplift and what other potential uh, reservoirs uh, around the state really shine, even though they're maybe a little further from the, from the source or the, uh, or the pipeline? for future development. Uh, should we be looking at carbonates or, or are we going into a carbonate there? Or could you kind of expand on that a little bit, please? Yeah, so Mr. Chairman, Senator Cooper, thank you for the question. Uh, the, the reservoirs of interest at the Rock Springs Uplift are the Paleozoic Weber and Madison formations and the Jurassic Nugget formation. The Nugget in particular is nearly 500 feet thick. It's got great porosity, great permeability. Um, it could be one of those world-class reservoirs that the textbooks write about. Stepping out away from the Rock Springs uplift, nearly every basin in Wyoming has high storage potential. Uh, the interesting thing is for years, we've been using the pore space of the Cretaceous rocks in Wyoming to harvest oil and gas. If we step down a little bit to the Jurassic, the Jurassic sediments don't really hold oil and gas. And it's not because they couldn't hold it, it's because they were never charged. Those Jurassic sediments have a uh, really great pore space in almost every basin of Wyoming. So what I, I could see stepping away from the Rock Springs uplift, more work needs to be done, but I think there's high potential across the state for geologic storage. The, uh, the Trona mines are about 2000 feet and up. How deep are, is your well that you would inject in? Is that a 10,000 foot well? Mr. Chairman, uh, the well at the Rock Springs uplift is 12,000 feet. So over two miles below the surface, well below the minerals that are produced today. I'd like to just quickly also send a nod that we're not only focused on Wyoming, but we do have international reputations and projects. Uh, we've been working with China for nearly a decade, um, working with China on their coal to chemical industry. We've been able to demonstrate that we can capture CO2 from their coal to chemicals and ship it to a nearby oil field for injection um, and harvest of additional oil. Number five, I'd like to just point out we have one pending proposal um, that is looking at a feed study on a new hydrogen facility that would be placed here in Wyoming. It would be full carbon capture on something on the scale of about 200 million standard cubic feet per day. So we are forward looking beyond coal, looking at these other industries that could benefit from carbon capture and storage and helping to recruit those to the state. Representative Greer. Yeah, thank you. So we had discussed um, that SCR could put together a life cycle of hydrogen sort of the development uh, in, in the offshoot. And I understood SER would, would try to get that out for informational purposes. Like, could you make sure that this committee gets a copy of that as soon as it is completed? Mr. Chairman, absolutely. Like next <laughs> week, right? <laughs> we, will, we will turn it as fast as we can, Mr. Okay. Chairman. Thank you. Next slide, please. And next slide. So I do, want, I do want to share some updates on the Wyoming Carbon Safe Project. Uh, the Carbon Safe Program at the Department of Energy, this is the flagship program for carbon capture and storage. This is the program that is focused on moving carbon capture and storage to commercialization. We've been involved in this program since 2017. It's a phased project uh, with competitive down select. So we started with 13 projects across the country through the different phases, we're now down to five. There's only five left. Wyoming has one of those. Project Tundra is another. Uh, the University 
uh, at Illinois and Southern States Energy Board and New Mexico. So they're, they're spaced around the country. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'm a homer. I do feel that uh, Wyoming Carbon Safe is, is ahead of the rest, um, but we're very supportive of this program and seeing it go forward. Uh, next slide, please. So what is Carbon Safe? We're, it's the geologic storage component. So we're looking at the feasibility of geologic storage at Dry Fork Station near Gillette, uh, just north of Gillette. Uh, we're looking at problems like how big is the storage tank? How much CO2 can we put down? Can we do it economically? Can we do it safely? What is the permitting that needs to be done? The environmental assessments, the NEPA assessments, everything else that needs to be done to move this towards commercialization. And this is a commercial scale project. We're looking at capturing at least 2 million tons from Dry Fork Station for 30 years to, to equal at least 50 million tons. Next slide, please. Mr. Chairman, Dry Fork Station is one of the newest, cleanest coal-fired power plants in the US. It has a long operating life ahead of it. It's scheduled to operate until 2072. So it is not a power plant that's looking to close its doors tomorrow. This is a power plant that's going to need a carbon management plan and a carbon, uh, and likely a carbon capture and storage unit uh, going forward. I look at this plant and I see the next generation of coal. I think that what's missing from carbon capture and storage today is that one first impression project that tells the United States that we can capture carbon dioxide from coal, we can do it economically, we can do it safely, and we can store it permanently. Once that first impression project is in place, I think others will follow. Connected to Dry Fork Station is the Wyoming Integrated Test Center, which everybody in this panel knows well. Uh, it is a research facility for the for looking at carbon capture utilization and storage. Next slide, please. Representative Heiner, question. Thank you, Chairman. I, I see here on your slide, Scott, that uh, this dry fork station produces 3.3 million tons per, per year, but you're only gonna capture 2 million tons per year. Is that correct? So it's not 100% efficient? Mr. Chairman, Representative Heiner, great question. So the, the DOE program sets the minimum at 2 million tons per year. The Wyoming Carbon Safe program is looking at full capture at Dry Fork Station and what that could mean. So the reservoir won't be able to handle 30 years then if you capture 3.3 million, is that, is that possible? Mr. Chairman, Representative Heiner, all of our models are looking at, are adapted to the CO2 outputs at Dry Fork Station. So we are looking at full capture and storage. Thank you. So full, full, full capture for 30 years? Yes, yes. So the, the parameters Actually, set by the Department of Energy years. says you, to, in order to qualify, you have to capture at least 2 million tons and you have to do it for 30 years. So they set that to, to ensure that we're working on commercial large scale projects. This, this plant would actually, you'd actually be capturing it for what, uh, well, 40, 50 years, 50 years. Would we run out of storage space or does that storage space sort of expand? Mr. Chairman, we've got plenty of storage space that it would, it would require just drilling and stepping out with additional wells. Oh, oh. yep. Mr. Co-Chairman. Yeah, thank you. The economic realities of carbon capture also bring in the use of CO2 for enhanced oil recovery. As, as a revenue stream, is that, is that not correct? Mr. Chairman, that's correct. So at Dry Fork Station, we are looking at revenue streams from enhanced oil recovery that uh, is in the area. We're looking at revenue streams from potential carbon credits, uh, revenue streams from 45Q, uh, all of those put together to, to develop the economic model. And Mr. Yeah. Chairman, so while you're meeting the parameters of the carbon safe program, um, for the 200,000 tons of capture that the reality is, is that economics um, and political environment may dictate that that CO2 is used otherwise and not just sequestered. Is that, is that fair? Mr. Chairman, that's absolutely true. And, and, so, then follow -up. A, yeah, follow -up. and so I assume you're working closely with EORI, uh, which is a component that reports to SER and 
in communicating. And uh, also, again, with the WEA, Wyoming Energy Authority, that we all look at all the above options associated with this. Mr. Chairman, you're absolutely right. We are working closely with the Enhanced Oil Recovery Institute, the Wyoming Energy Authority. We have national partners at the Energy Environmental Research Center at University of North Dakota, National Labs, uh, Los Alamos National Lab, uh, Advanced Resources International, which is a well-known enhanced oil recovery modeling group. Um, so we, we're putting a lot of bright minds together and working all together on this project. Scott, uh, if we're going to sequester that for EORI, I'm assuming we're working with the Petroleum Association of Wyoming also for where we're, who's going to use it. Mr. Chairman, that's a team member we haven't added that we will. Yeah. Thank you for the suggestion. So they need something to do anyway. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Representative Hyder. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Scott, I, I see that you're, you're focusing on membrane technology for the CO2 removal. With a little bit of experience that I have with membranes uh, with CO2 removal, they do plug up. And so what, what's your projection for replacing the membrane? Is it, is it going to last for 30 years or how often will you have to replace that membrane? Yeah. Mr. Chairman, Representative Heiner, I don't have the answer to that question. So we are working with membrane technology research out of Southern California, and that, that is their novel technology that's being applied to uh, the capture at this plant. Um, so it's in development stage, and I think that's one of the questions they're at, trying to answer is how long will these membranes last and how long um, and what the maintenance costs are going to be with it. Follow up? Yeah. You bet. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. One more question, Scott. As you try, as you experiment and, and uh, advance the CO2 capture, what is your biggest hurdle from a technology standpoint to make this economically viable? Mr. Chairman, Representative Heiner. The biggest hurdle for me is getting all of these moving pieces together and working in stride. Um, so to date, the carbon storage program has been working over here and the carbon capture program has been working over here. As we move into this third phase of carbon safe, for the first time, we'll be seeing these capture technologies and storage technologies working together. So I think one of the biggest hurdles is getting everybody in the same room moving forward in the same direction. I also think that there's a lot of hurdles um, from a regulatory, maybe permitting perspective. Uh, we haven't permitted a class six well yet in Wyoming. And in fact, there's only been two class six wells permitted in the entire United States. So that's another first impression type of project that we need to do. There's other things, other questions that are out there around pore space. Uh, what can we do on federal pore space? What can we do with liability? So Mr. Chairman, Representative Heiner, there still is a lot of questions out there and, and we're working frantically um, and at a high speed chase to, to answer those. Scott, the two wells you've drilled, what class are they? Are they class two? Or you didn't, didn't put them as class six? Uh, Mr. Chairman, they will eventually be fully permitted class six wells with the approval of Department of Environmental Quality. We started with a, uh, we did drill a well in 2019 as a stratigraphic test well. We will be out there in August and September, hopefully drilling our second well. And though that one will be permitted as a class one. Why are we going with the class one well? We wanna do some brine injection tests so that we can understand what the flow is in those formations and dial in our models so that we can use those for the class six permit. The class six wells don't allow for brine ejection, class ones do. So we're starting with the class one and we will amend to a class six well. The brine, does the brine act like uh, CO2 in the reservoir? It would seem like it would be a little heavier than the CO2. Hey, Mr. Chairman, uh, astute question. It is a little bit heavier, it's a little more dense. Uh, CO2, when it's injected into formation at those depths, is a fluid. It's not a gas anymore. It's called, it's a super critical fluid. So it does behave much more like a brine than a gas. Um, so it, brine is a good substitute, and it can tell us a lot of information about that formation without putting CO2 into it. Hmm. Yes. Senator Cooper. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Scott, it's, logistically, will you be handling the CO2 on the surface as a liquid or in the gas phase? Mr. Chairman, Senator Cooper, uh, the CO2 on the surface needs to be compressed to a supercritical phase before it's injected down. It, it's, it's much more efficient to do it that way. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. So for these pilot projects, um, we'll be actually trucking it in in a liquid phase more, more than likely, is that right? And, and pumping it rather than, than injecting it as a, as a gas. And secondly, could you uh, explain to all of us uh, the difference between a class six and a class one? Is it just the tubulars, the type of steel involved or, or uh, the cementing process or? Could you, could you go into that just a little bit, please? Mr. Chairman, Senator Cooper, the difference between a class one and a class six well, class six well is developed prime for the sole purpose of, purpose of injecting CO2. Uh, and there is a construction, uh, a well construction that goes along with that, that's specifically designed to be non-corrosive for CO2. CO2 itself is not corrosive. If you mix it with water, it can be corrosive on some materials. So the weld program has to be designed to handle those types of materials. Uh, cements are the same way. There are also additional uh, tests and modeling work that needs to be done with the class six that, that aren't present in a class one well. Uh, for example, you have to estimate and model both your CO2 plume in the subsurface, but you also have to understand the pressure plume out away from that CO2 plume. So it is a much more stringent uh, regulatory program under class six. Hello, no. The biggest thing I hear from everybody is that the class six has so many more uh, uh, governing bodies watching it that uh, they really don't wanna do it. And, of course, we're, we, we need to do it, so Mr. Ahead. Chairman, I would, I would agree that it's a, it's a much more uh, exhaustive process for class six wells, and it is going to take time. Go so ahead. to continue, I'd just like to point out the yellow square there is the location of the Wyoming Carbon Safe Project. So that's approximately 2,400 feet south of Dry Fork Station. <laughs> So you've got Dry Fork Station there, the newest, cleanest coal-fired power plant in the US. You've got the Integrated Test Center, which is the CO2 research facility, and, and we have the Carbon Safe project there. So we've got significant private, federal, and state investment all working together in this, in this one location. I think that really is a recipe for success. Scott, if you take all the, the stack from Dry Fork, what, will ITC have anything to use or Will you leave them enough to still do research there? Mr. Chairman, if we get to the point where we're collecting all of the CO2 from dry fork, I think we've accomplished our mission. But I believe there can and will be CO2 available for continued research. Next slide, please. And as previously been mentioned, MTR, Membrane Technology Research, is working on the carbon capture uh, for the plant. They're going through the full feed study now. Um, that should be complete here in the next year or two. Next slide, please. I do wanna point out also that recently, MTR also received a $65 million award from the Department of Energy in their large scale pilot program that will be capturing uh, CO2 at the integrated test center um, by circa 2023. So they should have about 40,000 tons of CO2 per year available within the next couple of years. Next slide, please. Going back to the carbon storage component, we've been pretty busy over the last uh, four years. Numbers one through 15 point out where we've been working and what we've accomplished. This document here is the phase one approach. This was to, just done in 2017. We recently completed phase two, which is this document here. Mr. Chairman, as you asked, it does include a full chapter on the potential for enhanced oil recovery revenues in the area. It also contains model project agreements for force-based leasing, offtake agreements, 
It has a full risk assessment, monitoring verification plans. The geologic site characterization is nearly done. We've done economic business plans. We've done workforce assessments. And we've done something I'm pr quite proud of is the public outreach and gaining the social license to operate in that community. Next slide, please. So what's next for Wyoming Carbon Safe in this next uh, upcoming months? We are in phase three. Uh, as I mentioned, we'll be drilling a second well here this fall. Uh, we'll be doing some reservoir injection tests. We'll be working closely with MTR to integrate their findings from their feed study into the full scale project. And we'll be starting to complete the first, what I think will be the first class six permits for Wyoming. And most importantly, we'll be advancing the commerciality at this carbon storage hub. Next slide, please. Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to step back and point out some of the other benefits from large scale energy research programs. Using carbon safe as an example, I'd like to note that through this program, we've received over $33 million in funding. 26 and a half of that has been from the federal government through the Department of Energy. Five and a half of that has been through private investment. A million and a half of that has come from the state. If you look at those dollars, you'll start to see that the state has invested about a dollar for every $22 that we've been able to bring into this project. Local impact, about $11.1 million has been invested in Campbell County through this project. So it flows to the University of Wyoming, but I want you to know that it also flows out to our local communities. We funded 14 graduate students for this program over the last 14 years. And we've created 27 research jobs at the University of Wyoming. These are advanced degree, high paying jobs. Energy research is an area that Wyoming um, can benefit from. It's a great place to field test technologies. And I think the Department of Energy is starting to understand that. Next slide, please. So I'd like to just point out uh, even though we're in phase three, we already have our eyes set on phase four of carbon safe. This phase four is the final construction and completion of the program. We're looking at starting in 2023 and injecting CO2 by 2026. Phase four has not been appropriated yet, and there's no commitment from the Department of Energy to do so, although it's not too early to begin the discussions. This will be about a 40 to $50 million project to complete the storage component of Wyoming Carbon Safe. As I mentioned, it'll be, if funded, it'll be an FY23 federal appropriations. To leverage that 40 to $50 million, we will be fundraising an additional eight to $10 million in cost share. I just wanted to identify that for the committee. Moving forward also depends on the successful completion of phase three. We have to go out there this fall and we have to demonstrate that we can complete the characterization of this project and we have to finish it up. <laughs> on budget and on time. And number three, we can't move forward without the support of the state, without our industry partners. Um, at the end of the day, this is going to be a business decision for Basin Electric. And we really can't move forward without our local community support. So Mr. Chairman, with that, let me close and, and fin finalize my testimony. Scott, that cost share eight to 10 million could be from the industry that's gonna benefit from this also, couldn't it? You're, you're not strictly saying that's from the state. Mr. Chairman, I, I do see that that cost share should be a component of industry, state, and private, yeah, private investment. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Chairman. So Scott, the, the 10 million we appropriated this year, of course, we, we set it with the governor's office with a broad scope of carbon capture, but the concept is that that money is there uh, and available. Uh, so as you apply for these grants, um, people know, uh, the business knows that we have state buy-in, federal government knows we have state buy-in. Is that, that type of appropriation very beneficial, I assume? Mr. Chairman, that's exactly what we need to keep these pro pro projects going forward. We need opportunistic funds that are there and available when these um, grants, call for grants come out. I have one more, yeah, maybe okay. follow up, Mr. Oh, go ahead, yeah, Representative. No, 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 no. Well, so <clears throat> Scott, um, 
you know, Wyoming really got out front with, with respect to defining who owns pore space. So we have a question of how the federal government is going to interpret that, which we, we and I'm, one question is, what is SDR doing to, to try to drive uh, their adoption of our perception of property rights? Um, and then second of all is if I come down to a checklist of items and the committee's already heard this, um, be beneficial for the committee to work on. Um, I, don't, I don't like the term liability transfer, but on CO2 storage fields that we put an end gate or a statute of limitations or something, how beneficial would that be? So two questions for you, sir. Mr. Chairman, to address your first question, uh, poor space. We do have a lot of federal lands in Wyoming and the federal government has yet to determine how they're going to look at poor space from a carbon storage perspective. SCR is working on that. There's a chapter on that in this, in this report. And Professor Terry Rigetti is working closely with um, our federal delegation and others to ensure that that conversation is upfront and, and being had. Mr. Chairman, to answer your second question, liability. I do think liability and, and the potential to transfer uh, would help spur industrial development, at least in these early projects. They're looking for, like I said, there has not been a first impression project out there. Um, and the risk of liability is something that the private industry is, is considering. Scott, would that uh, liability be something Kager would be looking at? Uh, Mr. Chairman, yes, we are we are looking at it. I could also point the committee to how uh, North Dakota is looking at it. So there are other states that are out there. Um, we could provide a summary of of what other states are doing and and some recommendations for uh, that moving forward. Any other questions for? Uh, oh yes, Representative Burkhart. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Scott, a little maybe a little different path to pursue. Go down. Under the previous administration, I think uh, Wyoming got along great with the uh, Department of Energy. How, how's our working relationship with the current administration? Mr. Chairman. I know that's a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman, Representative Burkhart, it, it's no question that the priorities of this administration are different than the last. Um, funding, and, and we're gonna see it in funding and appropriations. For example, the, the president's budget cuts the oil and gas research program, cuts it from the federal appropriation budget. Um, how is our relationship? The, the folks we have worked with for years at Department of Energy are still there. So the relationship is fine, priorities are changing and funding is going to be put in other buckets. So I think our approach and our, how our angle, um, how we approach these projects is going to be important. Mr. Chairman, follow up? Yes. So, Scott, are we positioned to take advantage of funding in those other areas to apply for it and potentially get it? Mr. Chairman, Representative Bur Burkhart, absolutely. Um, so there is going to be a lot of funding still in carbon management, carbon storage. We're positioned well there. We're positioned well to uh, respond to funding proposals on critical minerals and rare earths, which is obvious it's going to be a new uh, area of focus for this administration. And, and, and there's several others. Hydrogen in particular, I think is, is one that we're uh, focusing on too. Other questions for Mr. Quillen? Other questions? Other questions? Hearing none, thank you, Scott. Thanks for coming up and addressing us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> is there public comment? Uh, on this subject, any public comment on the extra work we're sending to the PAW? No. <laughs> nobody, nobody online that wants to speak on this. All right, public comment is closed then. We'll move to the next subject. Mr. Chairman, uh, yes. while we're on this subject, I would um, offer a motion that we ask LSO to draft uh, uh, prepare a bill draft for our consideration for the rest of the interim uh, regarding the transfer of liability based off the North Dakota model. Second. Moving seconded for LSO to prepare a bill for 
uh, poor space liability. Is that what we're yeah. talking about? Yeah, sounds good. Poor space liability. And they can just write that bill and solve that problem. Mr. Mr. Chairman. Yes. W one thing with that, uh, I think in there, we need to maybe come up with a different term than poor space liability. I know that'll take some work. I don't have anything on the top of my head, but again, it's perception rather than fact. Uh, yeah. That we can, I think we could word it to, to do that. Uh, and I can work with LSO on that. There's also been some work done in the Gulf of Mexico on storage and those issues. Mr. Yes. Thanks, Mr. Senator Roth. Uh, we do have a definition of poor space ownership um, from the original carbon sequ caption sequestration legislation, which was what, 11, 12 years ago or something when that was passed, if I'm not mistaken. So we want to make sure that we're statutorily conforming with that. So we, we might be stuck with some terms unless we want to change those terms. But um, I, I do agree that we should be thoughtful about what we're calling it and, and how we're treating it as we move forward. Okay, LSO, you got that? You're gonna fix all that? Okay, all right. Now we'll move on to the next subject. Next subject is nuclear power generation in Wyoming. And we have Mr. Some... Chairman, do you want to take a vote on? Yeah. Oh, excuse me. Excuse me. He's assumed it. Yeah. Did you want to take a vote I'm on that? Here on the left, but we need to take a vote. <laughs> so, so the motion is to uh, prepare a bill for a poor space, whatever we're calling liability. We're going to change that word. We're going to take uh, a vote on that. We're not going to take a vote on it. So if there, if there be no objection, we'll cast unanimous ballot. Is there any objection? All right, we'll cast an unanimous ballot on that then. <laughs> Good work. Campbell County guys wanted to vote. <laughs> yeah, they did. Yeah, they did. <laughs> All right, now, now are you satisfied, Senator Westberger? <laughs> now we'll move to nuclear power generation in Wyoming. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is uh, John Cox. I'm uh, the Vice President of Government Affairs for Rocky Mountain Power. I'm uh, joined today uh, by Jeff Navin, who is the External Affairs Director for uh, Terra Power. Um, I'll just briefly introduce uh, the subject and then turn the time to, to Jeff to talk about this specific project, to talk about the technology. Um, at any point in time during our presentation, you know, we welcome questions, you know, interjections, and, and we're happy to respond to those. I, I would say, uh, again, just to, to preface the, the comments here for the committee and, and those in the public listening, uh, for, for additional information on the project, we, we have uh, built out a website on this uh, called uh, wyomingadvancedenergy.com. Um, that has uh, background on the project, but also, uh, and, and something that I, I especially wanted to highlight today, uh, a page full of frequently asked questions that we continue to add to. And uh, as we get questions today, if there's things that have not been addressed on that website, we're certainly happy to address those here in public, uh, but also put that out there on, on the website uh, for those uh, in the state that uh, have similar questions. So with that, I'll turn the time to, to Mr. Navin uh, to explain the, the, the project and answer your questions. Thank you. Great. Thanks, John. And thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee for allowing me to be here today. Uh, my name is Jeff Navin. I'm the Director of External Affairs for TerraPower. TerraPower is an advanced nuclear company, and we're going to be working with Rocky Mountain Power to build our Natrium Advanced Reactor Demonstration Project in the state of Wyoming. And we couldn't be more excited about our partnership with Rocky Mountain Power, and we're really grateful for the warm reception that we've received here in Wyoming from the governor, the legislature, from community leaders around the state. We want to be a key contributor to Wyoming's economic and energy future, and, and we're gonna work very, very hard over the next number of months and years to earn your trust, to become your partner in that, in that endeavor. Um, Mr. Niven, can you give us a spelling on that last name? Sure, it's N-A-V-I-N. I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so a little about TerraPower um, and who we are and how we came to be. So in 2006, our company's founders, uh, Bill Gates and Nathan Mirvold, began looking at technological solutions to try to, do, to manage the dual challenges of the growing need 
for energy around the world um, and the challenges uh, associated with reducing emissions. And a key tool that they found was the development of advanced nuclear technologies. And the mission of our company and other advanced nuclear technologies like TerraPower is to improve nuclear technology on many fronts. We are using the capabilities offered by 21st century technologies, digital modeling, things that were unable to previous generations of nuclear uh, developers um, to move beyond, move the technology beyond what we currently have in our country's 20th century uh, technology in our current nuclear fleet. We want to improve on safety. We want to reduce the risk of weapons proliferation. We want to reduce the amount of waste that comes out of the back end of these reactors. We want to be more efficient in how we, how we use the uranium inside of our reactors. And we also recognize that we need to make pretty significant improvements in cost reduction to be competitive uh, in today's energy market. So when we started our work, um, there was not a program in the United States to, to demonstrate advanced uh, nuclear uh, reactors. Um, and under a government to government agreement between the United States and the Department of Energy uh, and China, we initially reached an agreement to do our work there to demonstrate our reactor in China, which was seeing their energy demand increase pretty dramatically. But in the last number of years, a lot of things have changed uh, given in the relationship between the United States and China, both at the government level and at the commercial level. Um, and uh, uh, first, there were some policy changes in Washington that made it impossible for us to do our work in China. But secondly, and more importantly, with the support of the Wyoming federal delegation, the United States stood up an advanced reactor demonstration program that would allow us to demonstrate this technology here in the United States. Uh, and last year, TerraPower Terra Power competed for and we were selected for an award through that program to demonstrate our natrium technology, which is developed in partnership with GE Hitachi. Um, and we're gonna be in this program, we're gonna be part of a public private partnership with the US Department of Energy to demonstrate the natrium reactor within the next seven years. Under this program, the Department of Energy will fund 50% of the cost of the project and TerraPower will be on the hook for the other 50% uh, of that financing. Um, once the plant is built, um, Rocky Mountain Power will own and operate that plant as part of its energy generation fleet. And that, um, you know, just to, just to put a finer point on that, that means that TerraPower is assuming the risk of cost overruns, the risk of cost increases. That's not going to be something that's going to be put either on the state of Wyoming or on Rocky Mountain Power's ratepayers. So we're pretty confident, though, that that, that that completed project is going to be very valuable to Rocky Mountain Power and its customers. Natrium is specifically designed to meet the needs of a 21st century grid. Today, every commercial reactor in the United States uses heat generated from the reactor core to produce steam and spin a turbine, exactly like coal plants do, right? It's a, the nuclear reaction is just a slightly more complicated way to produce the heat than the combustion of coal. But natrium's different. Before, um, um, what we are gonna do is heat that heat, uh, use the heat from the reactor to run a large molten salt energy storage system essentially a massive, massive battery that gives a lot of flexibility to our customers and the operators to respond to an evolving grid with different types of energy generation um, on, on the system. We can store 500 megawatts of electricity for up to five and a half hours. So when electricity demand is high, we can put more power onto the grid. When it's low, we can take power. We can, we can reduce the amount of power that we're putting onto the grid. Um, that energy storage component is four times larger than the biggest lithium ion battery plant that is currently deployed around the world. So you hear a lot about energy storage in the electricity sector and the power sector. Um, this is a real massive and a real big game changer um, on, on that front. Um, so what makes it value, what makes this valuable is, is the ability to, to respond to that supply and demand on the energy system. Um, and it's also uh, the only real form of energy that's out there right now that gives you all of the tools that you would look for in a generation system. We can provide firm baseload power 24 seven around the clock. Our power is emissions free. We also can be flexible to integrate into grids that need that flexibility as, as supply and demand fluctuate on the power grid.
Now, we know that these attributes are going to make natrium attractive to Rocky Mountain Power and to potential customers, but we know that every nuclear reactor that is going to be built has to meet uh, two really important criteria. The first is obviously safety. The second is cost. And uh, we've designed Natrium to make step change improvements in safety that also allow us to simultaneously reduce our costs. So I'm, I'm going to get a little, a little bit technical here, so, so bear with me for a moment because I think it's important to kind of walk through our system and how our system's um, uh, a little bit different. So most 20th century nuclear designs use water as a coolant. Every, every reactor in the United States uses water as a coolant. And to ensure that the coolant doesn't reach its boiling point, because if that coolant boils, turns into steam and boils off, then you don't have a coolant. And then the reactor core gets very, very hot and a meltdown occurs. A meltdown is literally the core getting so hot that it melts down through the floor of the reactor vessel itself. So you got to keep that coolant on. Using water as a coolant means you can't let it boil to prevent it from boiling. You operate it at, at very high pressure because that pressure increases the boiling point of the water. So, uh, and that water constantly has to be circulated through the core to ensure that, uh, that, you're, that you're removing that heat. So that means you've got to have lots of redundancies in place to keep the pumps running, to keep the water moving. And you also are operating a system that operates at very high pressure. So. I know a lot of you have some of your backgrounds in the in the energy industry. You know, when you're operating at high pressures, you're putting a lot of stress on that system. Natrium is different, and, be, and we've designed it to be different so that we provide significant improvements in safety over conventional designs. The architecture uh, uh, means that we will not require active safety systems. We don't have the need for diesel engines and generators to provide backup power. Um, we don't have to have multiple backup systems and, and, and or even human intervention in most, most um, emergency scenarios. So instead of water, natrium uses a liquid metal, sodium as our coolant. That's where we get the name for the reactor. Natrium is the Latin word for sodium. Sodium's boiling point is 882 degrees Celsius. Mr. Chairman? Um, yeah. Mr. Nevin, <clears throat> I hate to interrupt you, but a question. We sure. heard both sodium and sodium salts. So just for yep. my clarification, yep. are we dealing with a with sodium metal or with a sodium uh, salt? So the reactor coolant is metal. It's sodium okay. metal. Okay. Uh, gets hot enough, it turns into a liquid form. Um, and, and, and that's what's get actually in the core itself that cools the, the reactor vessel. We use a molten salt storage system which okay. is, uh, you know, a different chemical compound. Um, and if you look, so there at the at the, at, I could just give you this is this is a, a you know a, a, an architectural rendering of what what the plant will look like. And obviously, our graphic designer is going to predict that the drought will have ended by the time we we build our <laughs> reactor. Um, in the foreground, the taller building is the reactor is the reactor uh, building. So the reactor is inside of that building, um, and then you see the pipes that go from that building kind of in the center of the screen back to the, uh, to, the, to the area with the two tanks. That's the storage system and the electricity generation system. So in, the, in that tall building in the middle is where the reactor is located. It's below grade, it's generating heat, it's heating up um, a, a, salt, um, a, a, a molten salt loop that comes in through those, through those pipes. Hot salt goes out and goes into one of the tanks it goes into that building in the back where the, where the steam turbine is. It's an off the shelf general electric steam turbine, produces the electricity, the cool salt goes into the other tank. It waits there until it's needed and then it flows back in and, and, it, and, it, and it's heated. So that's just a little bit of an overview of what, of, of what the system looks like. But yet the coolant is, is sodium, the metal, the uh, working fluid for the energy storage system is a molten salt. Okay, thank you very much. Thank, thanks for your question. So, um, as, as noted, that liquid metal is a very high boiling point. And what that means is the reactor can't get hot enough to boil the coolant off. So in the event of, 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 of an accident happening or a loss of power, we don't have to touch anything to keep the reactor from, from melting down. That's a, that's a big change from the current designs that, uh, that, that, that exist. And like I noted, we also operate at atmospheric pressure. We don't have to add pressure to the system to keep that coolant from boiling. And that means a lot less stress on our system. It means fewer redundant safety systems are necessary, which helps us control costs. Um, and, it, and it prevents you know, high pressure, you have a leak, there's, a, there's an explosive release of that pressure. 
we don't have that, that challenge on, in our reactor. So we rely on natural laws of physics to maintain the safety of our plant. We don't need operator intervention or auxiliary power in the event of, of an incident. We're gonna use air, the properties of natural convection rather than water as our ultimate, as our ultimate heat sink. So this dramatically improves our safety profile. Um, if the reactor at Fukushima, for example, had been designed like natrium, there would not have been an accident. The meltdown at Fukushima occurred when the auxiliary diesel generators were disabled by saltwater flooding associated with the tsunami. Um, they couldn't power the pumps, needed to circulate the water over the core. The water boiled off and the core melted. Natrium's coolant wouldn't have boiled off. It doesn't require the auxiliary power and it would have shut itself down independently by itself indefinitely and put itself into a safe state. So, and finally, you know, our reactor is roughly one third of the size of the larger plants that are operating in the United States. Um, our smaller size, our low pressure, our ability to use that coolant to absorb the high levels of heat both reduces the chance of an accident, but it also reduces the scale uh, of an incident. You know, um, we're at 345 megawatts. Typical big reactor in the United States is a gigawatt in size. Um, and again, because they have that high pressure that, 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 that it does change the safety profile of the, of the area. So, you know, we've been working with some of the best minds in the country on our reactor. Uh, we've been working on this technology for 15 years. We've built on decades and decades of learnings on uh, traditional reactors, on sodium fast reactors, places like Idaho National Laboratory. Um, uh, but we, we certainly are not gonna just ask you to simply take our word when it comes to safety, the safety of the state and the safety of your constituents. Um, so, you know, we are also not gonna be able to do anything with this reactor unless, until it's fully licensed by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. We will be applying for a construction license. So they will sign off on our design, on our construction plans and the like. And then obviously we will seek an operating license from them in order to turn, turn the reactor on. The NRC is the gold standard around the world when it comes to nuclear safety. Um, and um, we have a very strong safety track record in the United States that's largely uh, due to the very stringent safety requirements that we are required um, to, to meet. Mr. Chairman, question here. Senator Rothfuss. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Navin, uh, I'll, I'll start off by saying I'm a very enthusiastic supporter of this project and, and of this work, but at the same time, I'm, 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 we, we've had conversations. I, I wanna make sure that the, the safety uh, concerns that have been raised are, are thoroughly addressed. And I, I want to hear some preliminary thoughts about the sodium concerns with previous sodium fast reactors and all of the work in, in the past and, and hear uh, what the approach is with natrium that's sort of different from some of the concerns that we've seen in the past. It, it's my understanding that you've, you've got this, you've got a molten salt that's coming into contact effectively with the, through heat exchangers with the energy that's, that's uh, being uh, put to the sodium. But the concern with sodium always is, you know, does it ever see air? Does it ever see water? If yes, bad, uh, effectively. So what are the additional assurances? What, what is the, the new strategy here that addresses the concerns that have been raised through other sodium reactors in the past? And how is, how is natrium different when it comes to the handling of the, the sodium as the coolant? Great, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for the question, Senator Rothfuss. Um, so you're absolutely right. We are building, we're, we're taking very seriously the learnings that we've had from other sodium reactors, which have largely been test reactors, demonstration you know, types of reactors, um, uh, both in the United States and around the world. Um, the first thing that we've done is we've separated the water the steam part of the plant. Um, if you remember that it's actually literally across the fence hundreds of yards away from where the sodium coolant is. So um, um, we have uh, uh, put some of the issues that have happened in the past have been when you had steam generated directly uh, on top of that, that sodium piece where the sodium heat, the sodium's flowing through and creating the steam itself. So we've separated that by a significant, significant margin. You know, secondly, we've looked in great detail at all of the previous incidents that have occurred with, with sodium. When sodium uh, interacts with air, it does it, it, it insufficient um, volume and surface area can create a fire. So, um, our, so all of our sodium uh, piping is gonna be wrapped 
with a, you know, another, another uh, pipe around it with an inert gas filled uh, in between to, pre pre to prevent that fire. So if we did have a leak in a primary pipe, we would be able to detect it within the secondary pipe and we could shut the system down and address that problem before it got to a point where it was, um, you know, interacting with air. There are also some things, some very basic things that you can do in terms of um, um, changing the geometry of, of, of what, a, what, a, what a catch plate could look like that could quickly smother a sodium fire. Um, if, if you did have, you know, if it got through those two layers of, of protection and it got into the, into the atmosphere. Um, and so, so, you know, we, when I say that we're not going to require the multiple redundant safety systems that a light water reactor plant has, it doesn't mean we're not going to have multiple and redundant safety systems to prevent the, the accidents from this specific um, um, reactor. Um, we are still certainly in the design phase. We are engaging with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. That is a question they are going to take, take a very, very hard look at and take very, very seriously. Um, uh, we have really good engineers and scientists on our team. We're working with GE Itachi, who um, developed the PRISM reactor. Our reactor is a combination of two sorts of pieces of technology. Those two reactors combined have many, many decades of design experience. So we're going to take the best of what we're able to learn from them, uh, the best of what we've been able to learn and, and develop uh, a system that, that I think is going to be head and shoulders best in class. But you know, the other thing that, that the nuclear industry Anyone who's worked in it knows they take safety extraordinarily seriously. Um, and there's probably no other industry that does a better job of sharing information across companies, across countries to ensure that we have these learnings. So um, there have been, you know, back in the Wild West days of reactor development, we had sodium fast reactors out in Idaho. Um, they pushed those uh, to the limit and in many cases beyond the limits of those designs. Um, and we're going to take those learnings as well and apply it to the development of our reactor. Follow up. <clears throat> Thank you. What's the what's the salt that's intended to be used as the the working fluid or the, the um, transfer fluid? Excuse me. So it's a it's. I can I will get you the exact compound of the salts that that we are that we are using. I will say that it is the. Uh, it's very similar to an off-the-shelf molten, uh, molten salt energy storage system that exists commercially today. Most of those have been in concentrated this concentrated solar industry. Yeah. So if you've seen those towers with all the mirrors that direct the, the sunlight to a to a collecting point and it gets very hot, um, uh, we're using that technology. We're not inventing inventing our own. But I'll, I'll get you the, the specifics. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And. The I guess the, the final question I have on that is is just if you could if there are some technical documents or or working documents that that provide more detail in this approach specifically to the sodium side of the safety which uh, honestly the nuclear side is of less of a concern I think than the sodium from from the history of of this type of research so I want to make sure that I'm. Um, seeing new approaches and, and that there, there aren't any real intrinsic safety problems. And, and the other concept, I know that Gen 4 reactors really prioritize um, fail safes and fundamental physics being the, the key to the safety. But the one place that that concern remains is, is the, you know, the large pool of, of sodium is a, a lot of energetic reactive potential where passive safety isn't necessarily going to achieve complete safety. So I, I would like to see those as, as you continue the progress and development. Mr. Chairman, yeah, we'd be happy to provide those to you, Senator, and we can go as, as deep as you would like on, uh, on, any, on any of those questions. Great, thank you. You, you probably shouldn't go too deep. He's a chemical engineer, so you can't, <laughs> can't don't go too deep. Yes, uh, Representative. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So uh, a follow on to Senator Rothfuss's questions. Are you going to do your own system safety analysis or are you going to hire that out? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, thanks for the question, uh, uh, Representative Burkhart. We, 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 safety is at the root of everything that we do in the design of this reactor. Um, uh, we also are going to work, you know, Bechtel is our, is our EPC. Um, G. Hitachi is our uh, engineering and design partner. Um, um, uh, and obviously, we are engaging it right now with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission um, as well. So we, we are going to completely do our own. We are, it is at the core of all, every question that we have in our design. 
we work with our partners to check our math, if you will, to make sure that we're doing it right. We have our EPC um, as a kind of independent auditor who can look at the assumptions we're making from the engineering and design point of view. And obviously we have a very, very knowledgeable and, and, and uh, uh, active regulator to make sure that as we're, that we're asking these questions. And just to be, you know, we, we're asking these questions early. It's not in our interest to kind of go down a road and then be told we have to back up and start over again uh, uh, as well. Thank you. Okay. Great. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I also just want to want to conclude by talking a little bit about why we're excited about Wyoming in, in particular. We think that Natrium is a great, great fit for Wyoming. Wyoming's been a global leader in energy for a century, uh, and it makes sense for Wyoming to continue to lead in new energy technologies like, like Natrium. If we can build this project on time and on budget, and we think that we can, the market for these technologies will be massive. If you go back to 1957, the first commercial reactor in the United States was built at a shipping port in Pennsylvania. Uh, it was the world's first full-scale commercial nuclear power plant, and it became the cornerstone for commercial light water uh, technology um, that really every reactor in the world uh, that's currently deployed uh, was an iteration of the shipping port design. Robust, nuclear industry in Pennsylvania that kind of came out of, of that, that demonstration project. And we think the same thing can happen here with Natrium. Um, it's also gonna provide markets obviously for the uranium mining industry in the state. Um, you know, with, with, if we can do what we hope to do, which is eventually build a hundred of these plants across the United States, that'll open up new markets for the minerals that, that you mine here in the state as well. It also makes sense for Wyoming also makes sense for us because of the very experienced and motivated workforce in the state. Um, we're building this, this project at the site of a coal plant that's being slated to be decommissioned. So that gives us access to things like the grid. It gives us access to water, but most importantly, it gives us access to a very highly skilled workforce who knows what it takes to keep an energy generation plant online and operating. So we're gonna need your highly skilled workforce to help us build our plant over the next number of years. And we're gonna need that highly skilled workforce to help us operate that plant. Our plant is designed to operate for 60 years. As we're seeing in the United States right now, many of those plants that have reached that 60 year time frame are now applying for license extensions that allow them to go to 80 years. So this is not a you know, short-term relationship we're gonna have with the community in which we site this reactor. We're talking 60 to 80 years of good high paying jobs in that community and 60 to 80 years of providing reliable power to Rocky Mountain Power and their, and their customers. Mr. Chairman. Yes, question here. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Naven. Naven. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the workforce. I mean, this is somewhat of a research project, uh, hopefully turned into a, a full power plant eventually. So what are you looking for, say, for construction workforce, uh, ongoing workforce? And being a research project, I would imagine that, you know, your workforce will have, you know, highs and lows of, of employment. But could you go into that a little bit, please, of what the workforce is going to look like? And then uh, I'll extend that to, to Mr. Cox of when you get to operate the plant, eventually it becomes your property, your operation. What are you looking at in workforce? So if the two of you could, please. Great. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative Burkhardt, for that question. So um, this is a demonstration program, but we are demonstrate a, demonstrating a fully commercial operating plant. This is not a prototype. This is not bench scale. We are going to deliver a commercially viable reactor and energy storage system to Rocky Mountain Power. Um, I can give you estimates. I can't give you exact number, obviously. Um, the time, you know, the timing, the time frame, and those things will matter. We estimate that we're going to need, um, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of, of two to three thousand construction workers to build this plant. They're going to be pretty highly skilled construction jobs. You know, this is um, um, we have pretty high standards that we have to meet in terms of being able to construct something that can pass our NRC licensing. Um, and then uh, on the operation side, we anticipate between three and four hundred jobs uh, over the next number of decades to to operate the plant. Um, I will just say one other thing on the jobs on the jobs piece, and I'm happy to turn it over to John as well. Um, Within the energy industry, nuclear is the highest paying sector. 
we pay more than fossil fuels, we pay more than coal and gas, we pay more than wind and solar. Um, we do require a very high level of workforce and, and, and we understand and are happy to pay uh, uh, wages commensurate with that workforce. So, um, you know, ultimately we, we feel like we have a very good chance of, of absorbing the current workforce at any of the, of the sites that we're looking at that currently operate coal plants. Um, and, and using those workers to operate our, our nuclear plant. John, any question that? from Representative Duncan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So uh, touching on what you just said about absorbing some of that workforce. So given the scenario, we have a power plant that's proposed to close. You're gonna come in, you're gonna retrofit that to your nuclear facility. So of that given workforce there, they may not have the skills that you're talking about this high skilled operational jobs. Are you willing to go in to these skilled workers at the level that they're at? Are you willing to take those workers and retrain them to be the higher skilled that you need? Or are you going to go, well, I'm sorry, and then bring in your own? That's my question. So we, we've looked a lot of, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the question. Thanks, Representative Duncan. We've looked very closely at this question. We think a lot of those jobs are going to transfer. Um, it takes a lot of skill to operate a 21st century coal plant. I mean, 21st century coal plant does not look like, you know, one that was built 100 years ago. They're constantly putting in pollution controls. You've got, you've got uh, you know, now Rocky Mountain Power and others are working to try to use coal plants to respond to changes in demand and load on the grid. It's a very different day than what it was maybe, you know, 40, 50 years ago. Um, we think many of those skills are going to directly transfer. Um, if you remember from the image, we had the back part of that plant. It's just a steam, using steam to spin a turbine to generate power. That's very similar to what's, what is happening across the road from the site that we're going to build at, you know, at the coal plant. To be sure, there are going to be some of these jobs, like you have to have a nuclear engineer on site at all time to operate the plant. Pr probably not local nuclear engineers will probably have to bring some of those pieces in. But, uh, but where there are needs for job training, we certainly will work with the state workforce development uh, agency, the Department of Labor, U.S. Department of Labor has a lot of resources available to fund job training programs. We will work with the unions that are on the site that have apprenticeship and job training programs as well. But our intention is to hire as many people as we can um, uh, locally. And I, you know, I can't sit here today and promise you that we're going to get to 100%, but I would be pretty surprised if we couldn't find some way to keep the people that are currently employed, employed in those projects that want to stay in those projects, either by utilizing their current skill sets or by partnering with your community colleges and workforce development authority to give them the skills that they need to, to, to move across the road and, and work on our plant. Yes, Representative Burkhart question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So. I think I'll follow up to that question to me that the next step is Wyoming has little to no institutional knowledge uh, statewide on nuclear power. This is all new territory for us. Uh, any ideas on what we need to be doing uh, to support this? Uh, uh, Mr. Cox and I have had a little a couple discussions that there may be future reactors coming in also as a potential. You know, what do you see Wyoming needs to be doing to supply the workforce needs uh, of all of that. Like I said, UW doesn't have a nuclear engineering program. We rely on the uh, Idaho State on a cooperative agreement, but what should we be doing? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for, for the question. And thank you, Representative Burkhart. Uh, you know, I, we're gonna start, we're starting this process with you. We announced this in, on June 2nd. Um, we, we hope, we, we intend to turn this reactor on in seven years. Um, I think that gives us some time to kind of think through some of these questions. We're, you're going to see a lot of us. We, are, we, we intend to be, like I said, we're going to be here for, for many decades with you. Um, and as we continue to flesh out exactly what the, what the, what the needs are in terms of workforce, um, we think there are lots of resources available um, uh, that we can bring into the university system, that we can bring into the community college system uh, to help put curriculum in place to help develop that, that workforce. Um, I will say that, that um, there are some efforts through the, the nuclear industry where they have helped to develop some of these curriculum for this very 
this very scenario that we're in, which is places that don't currently have nuclear job training programs to stand those, those training programs up and to have them in place in time uh, to, to, tra to, train, to train the workers. So we're happy to be a partner with you in thinking, thinking through those issues. It's, a, it's, it's, a, it's, it's as important to us as it is to you to, to make sure that we've got access to a quality workforce. Follow up, Mr. Yes, Chairman, sure. thank you. So you said something that, that spurred a question in my mind and that um, you said seven years. Can you really get this done in seven years? I mean, you look at the Vodal plant uh, one and two, and they've been ongoing for, it's kind of like the never ending project. <laughs> they're, they're six to $8 billion over cost, and it's still not up and operational. I think they've been working on that for 15, 12, 15 years. I mean, I, I, I think seven years is an aggressive schedule. Can you get it done? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for the question. It is absolutely an aggressive schedule. It's also what's mandated to us as part of our agreement with the federal government and the U.S. Department of Energy. Um, Congress has made clear to us that we have a seven-year time frame in order to, to get this reactor online. Um, we have worked closely with the NRC, um, which has been a source of of bottleneck and things slowing down in the past. Congress has made its intention through leadership, frankly, of Senator Barrasso, who passed legislation directing the NRC to be much more aggressive in, in bringing uh, resources to the table to help us get these advanced reactors licensed. Um, uh, you know, and I think the industry knows broadly that if the model is Vogel, the industry's done, right? So, so our just, you know, obviously our reactor is much smaller. It's a third of the size of uh, the, the reactor itself is a third of the size. Um, one of the other things that I think is gonna help us achieve that rate is if you, there's a reason that we had two separate, we have a nuclear island in the foreground and then in the back, we have the energy island. That energy island can be built to, you know, uh, uh, industry standards for construction that aren't nuclear industry standards. So nuclear concrete, nuclear piping, all of these things that are very expensive and, and difficult to do, we're gonna reduce the costs of those by reducing the size of those. So um, again, we feel like if we can engineer the safety piece into the design, it actually reduces the construction costs and the construction time because we're not, we're making things, even though we are an advanced reactor, the architecture is far simpler than the current generation of designs. So you are right to uh, you are right to to raise an eyebrow and say seven years seems awfully fast, and it is in the nuclear industry. Um, but uh, we take the charge that we received from Congress to meet that goal very very seriously, and it's it's absolutely our intention to to have this reactor built in that time frame. Question from Representative Bear. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Navin, you had mentioned earlier. Uh, that uh, there's access at these current plants to the grid. That's clear and easy to figure out. But you also mentioned water. Can you expand on the water comment, please? Yeah. So you know we will produce steam like um, you know just like 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 uh, like the coal plants currently do. I'm just looking because I do have some actual numbers. Great. So, uh, Re Representative Breyer, Mr. Chair, uh, our uh, Water consumption at a current coal plant, um, our belief as we've worked with TerraPower is that uh, the consumption would be less with a TerraPower uh, technology solution as opposed to our current coal operations. Yeah, we, we estimate that we're gonna need 6,500 acre feet of water per year. Um, and so just, uh, you know, the Naughton plant is using 9,000 acre feet a year, Bridger's using 20,000. So, so we think we're gonna use far less water than, than, is, than is currently being used at those sites. Yep. Oh, Representative Gray, did you have a question? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you review again the, the financial aspects of this, what the total cost is with specifics on the numbers and then the half, the, the share that the federal government is providing? Sure, happy to. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks, Representative Gray, for the question. So, uh, you know, the 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 advanced reactor demonstration program provides a cap that no project can exceed a total cost of four billion dollars. We are under that um, a bit. Um, Fifty percent of the cost of the of the of the reactor will be will be borne by the uh, Department of Energy. The other fifty percent will come from private investment. We're very fortunate to have. Uh, the chairman of our company um, be very committed to this and, and um, be able to 
to make warranty that we'll be able to meet that, that private cost share. Um, but what we're not doing, which is uh, uh, referenced in the, in the conversation about, about Vogel, we're not asking the ratepayers to, to assume those costs. What we will eventually do is uh, transfer the ownership of, of this project over to Rocky Mountain Power and they will, they will run it like, uh, like they do all of their other assets on the fleet. Um, but it's not gonna be one of these things where as the cost goes up, we come to you or we come to, to to the ratepayers of Rocky Mountain Power and ask them to absorb those costs. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So why does it make sense conceptually? I mean, when, you know, we hear over and over again that uh, the coal-fired power plants, which are mainstays in Wyoming, that they can't be, they, they don't want to retrofit them and the cost is too high. Why does it make sense for the taxpayer to be picking winners and losers here in this instance? Thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Gray. Um, I, I would uh, point to a couple, couple different things. So uh, we've acknowledged the uh, DOE investment in this particular project. Uh, in the previous presentation, uh, there was also reference to uh, 45Q tax credits for carbon capture uh, as an example. Uh, so there, there's multiple incentives out there. I think we're well aware of uh, federal subsidies for wind and solar. Um, we can question whether or not there's a level playing field or, or not, uh, but we, we operate with what's given to us. And uh, this is an opportunity for our, our customers that uh, we're certainly taking advantage of. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, but if you take the carbon capture stuff out and you're just gonna say, we're gonna do it the way man has done this now for a long time, and we're just gonna do upgrades to make it, make it work again for, for 50, 60 years, how much would it cost to retrofit a coal-fired power plant, you know, say in Glen Rock? Yeah, Mr. Chair and Representative Gray, uh, the operational life of these facilities is such that uh, they're coming to the end of that life. So it would not be so much extending the life 40 to 60 years, you'd be looking at building a, a completely new power plant. I don't have those numbers here in front of me here today. Uh, we do analyze all of those costs as part of our integrated resource plan. To Mr. Navin's point earlier, this will fit into that same planning process. And the costs that our customers would pay for an electron of electricity from any other source uh, they're not going to pay a, a cent more for this uh, because of the protections that Mr. Navin has mentioned. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so, you know, this whole thing about a demonstration, I mean, there's sort of a tenor there that the technical issues aren't worked out. So what technical issues haven't been worked out and, and, um, just so we have full transparency. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for the question, uh, Representative Gray. So um, th this project will demonstrate a first-of-a-kind sodium fast reactor as a commercial power plant. Um, there has never been a sodium fast reactor that's been built and owned and operated by a utility to produce electricity. There have been many sodium fast reactors that have been built as prototypes to test out the physics, to understand how, how um, you know, things operate going back to the 1950s and 1960s, all the way through um, rel relatively recently. A number of them have been built at the Idaho National Laboratory. Um, um, they've been built in, in places like Japan um, and other places uh, around the world. So we are taking advantage of previous R&D work that's been done to understand how these reactors operate. What we're doing for the first time is demonstrating that technology as a commercially viable civil power plant. So the technical issues um, you know, that, that we are gonna come across for the first time, um, you know, integrating a sodium of, uh, or in, integrating a, an advanced reactor with an energy storage system, that's never been done. Again, we are taking technology we're pretty comfortable with, we're coupling it with commercially available technology, but putting those two things together, for example, has, has never been done. So, um, you know, we, we are gonna do some new things with this reactor, but, um, um, but all of the physics aspects of what we're trying to accomplish have been, have been demonstrated in the real world. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So how is it commercially viable if, if the government's paying half of, for half of it? And my other question is, 
Um, there's been some concern on the, can you get into the coolant a little more, how exactly it works? Because there's some concern in the cold weather that, that, uh, this glad that sort of forms a glass like crust in cold weather. I mean, I, can you talk more about the coolant and then also how is it commercially viable if, if the federal government's providing half of the capital for the, for the production costs? Thank you. Sure. Thanks for the question, Mr. Chairman and Representative Cray. I, so with the caveat that I'm not a nuclear engineer, I'm happy to put you in touch with the folks on our team that are to get into more of those um, you know, specifics. Um, our coolant is a metal, it's, it's sodium. Um, it's gonna operate at a heat you know, that's gonna be generated by the reactor core itself to keep it in, in liquid form. Um, but the most, you know, the aspect of the coolant that we are most excited about is the, the fact that that coolant cannot boil. It cannot overheat. We cannot lose the coolant, which is a real concern in, in any nuclear plant that you're operating is to ensure that the coolant stays over the core so that the core itself doesn't, doesn't overheat. Um, in terms of the question about the commercial viability, you know, whether it's carbon capture and storage, whether it's nuclear power, whether it's um, development of any sort of commercial product, the first of a kind is always is always quite expensive. Um, you know, the first of a kind uh, vehicle that comes off an assembly line is certainly nowhere close to the the, the retail price you'll see in the sticker in the window. Um, we have to develop a supply chain. A lot of the components that are that we're going to have to build, the fuels that we're going to have to use, the fuel fabrication that we're going to have to be done. The first time you do those things, do add pretty significant costs. So uh, one of the things that the federal government has recognized is that helping technologies overcome that first of a kind cost challenge can then give us the opportunity to develop the supply chain to give manufacturers of pipes and pumps and, and control knobs and those types of things, the ability to see a market and then they can make investment in their own facilities. Um, same thing with our fuel, same thing with our fuel fabrication facilities and the like. So, um, you know, uh, it's tough to go to a manufacturer of anything and say, here's the specification that we need. We need one of these products, right? That's going to be much more, more expensive if, than if we go to them and say, over the next number of years, we're going to be buying dozens of these products and they can make those investments into their own facilities. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Naven, uh, based on that last comment, uh, you know, this, this project is to prove to prove commercialization of the concept. But if that is proven true, and we go into, like you mentioned, dozens of these in the future, I'm sure you have a, a business plan that does in a cost comparison of, of fossil fuel, new fossil fuel uh, power plants versus this natrium power plant. Will it be cost comparative? Will it be able to compete on the open market without uh, government paying half of the cost? Uh, Mr. Chairman, thanks for the question, and thank you, Representative Heiner. Yeah, we, I'm not sure you'd get very far with a business plan that requires constant and complete subsidy going forward through the life of your company. Um, one of the things that we looked at initially when, you know, our, 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 our founder, Bill Gates, understands markets and, um, you know, understood that uh, we needed products like nuclear to be available to meet growing demands for energy. But he looked at the current products that were being offered and said, these aren't going to get us there and challenged our engineering team to come up with ways to reduce costs while increasing safety. Um, so we do think we'll be competitive. Um, uh, we also think that the energy storage component of the system that of the product that we're offering is going to be really valuable to, to utilities. So it's not just about can we make electrons and what is the cost of those electrons, but um, how can we provide uh, a system that meets the demands and needs of our of our customers uh, as well. But um, yeah, our targets are to be are to be um, are to be competitive with with other forms of electricity that are that are on the grid. Follow up. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. On on another subject, you you will generate some nuclear waste, uh, albeit five times less than a conventional nuclear power plant. And you mentioned that you will be storing this on site. Can you? perhaps quantify how much that nuclear waste will be uh, per year or over the life of 50 to 80 years and, and what you're going to do to ensure that that is safe while it's being stored on site. Yeah, thank you for the question, Mr. Chairman and Representative Heiner. I, I, will, um, I, will, I will find 
I will get you volume numbers. Um, I don't have those off the top of my head, but I'll get you some estimates as to what that would look like um, for each year. In terms of how we're treating uh, the spent fuel, um, we are treating it as is the case with every other nuclear power plant. So it'll come out of the core. It will be stored for a while in water so that it can that uh, the fission products can can decay and we can take bulk of the heat off of those and then they'll move into dry cask storage which are you know steel and concrete lined casks in which the, the the fuel can the spent fuel can sit in for you know well over well over a hundred years ultimately that spent fuel is going to need to go into permanent geological repository which Anybody who's followed nuclear issues over the last decade or so knows that there's a issue with that. There's a bottleneck in Congress about how to how to deal with that with that that issue. Um, you know, I would like to see that resolved. The entire industry would like to see that resolved. Um, you know, we know that's going to take a little bit of time, um, but you know, we we are prepared to be able to ensure that that spent fuel can be safely stir, stored in the near term on site while we um, work with Congress to try to develop a, a broader solution for permanent geological uh, storage. Go ahead. Uh, well, great. Well, I, you know, I think we've covered, um, you know, just about, just about every, everything that I wanted to cover. I will say this, that we are really excited about the partnerships that we've been able to develop as a company. Our technology partner is uh, GE Hitachi. They bring decades of experience in nuclear and, and energy more broadly. Um, Rocky Mountain Power is a forward thinking utility that has really uh, embraced this project and seen the potential. And we're very ex excited to work, to work with them. We've got a great partner in the US Department of Energy. Um, you know, Jennifer Granholm, the new energy secretary participated in our event and in, at the, at, with the governor uh, at the beginning of, of the month. Um, but ultimately, we know that our biggest partnership is going to be here in Wyoming, where we're going to build this reactor, where we're going to operate this reactor. Um, we know that we're pretty new here. Um, you know, it's my second trip here in, uh, in the month, and probably we'll make many, many more trips over the coming uh, um, weeks and months. Um, but we look forward to earning your trust and earning uh, 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 the ability to be your partner in, in building this project, bringing it to the state of Wyoming and letting Wyoming continue to lead in energy like it's done for the last century. So, so thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, yes, uh, Representative Burkhardt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So Mr. Niven, you plan to make a decision, you and Rocky Mountain Power by the end of the year on where to site this. Now, I take that to mean December, but I would imagine it'll be sooner than that. So I would ask maybe after you make that decision, if they could come back to the committee, explain the decision, because then that puts in place a lot of, of various wheels to turn, if we could do that. I don't know if there's a question. I, I will just say, uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Burkhardt, that yes, the, the DOE uh, re requires that we, we select the site by the end of the year. So that has to occur. We'd like to do it sooner than that, though. And uh, we're, we're, we've got our ongoing integrated resource planning process uh, at this point in time. Uh, I, ideally, uh, if we could align those, that, that would work well. But as soon as we make that announcement, we'd welcome the opportunity to come back to this committee and, and present on that. We, we meet next uh, August 12th and 13th. We, we can listen to you then. <laughs> might, might need to be the next one. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Representative Gray has another question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. What is the procedure for the site selection and, and how does a community through its uh, the voice of its citizens withdraw from this? What's the procedure for a citizen to withdraw from consideration uh, for the siting? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and uh, Representative Gray. Uh, so we, we've begun the process of, of meeting with local uh, communities. Uh, we'll be out uh, continually until a decision is made. Uh, next week, we'll, we'll be in, I believe, the community uh, near, near uh, your district, Representative Gray, um, and we'll continue to have that dialogue. If a community does not want to be considered, uh, we, we, we'd love to know. Um, we, we've got uh, essentially four areas that uh, we're looking at at this point in time, and uh, you know, to date, uh, lo local officials have expressed uh, encouraging responses, um, and and uh, you know, should that change, uh, we're certainly open to that feedback. We want this to be, uh, you know, consent-based siting that we're working with these communities and we're not just uh, forcing this project upon them. Um, so, if if there are concerns from a community, we we'd like to hear that. 
and let me just let me just say I've worked in the nuclear industry for a while. This is the first time that I've ever seen a plant site selection use this model, where we identify a few potential sites, engage with the community to make sure that the community wants it. Early early indications are we've seen a lot of support from these communities of wanting of wanting us to consider them for the plant. And but but absolutely, you know, we got to. There's a lot of things we have to look at. We got to look at the geology of the ground. We've got to look at the water. We've got to look at the needs of the grid. Rocky Mountain Power has to think through what this is going to mean through their their IRP process. But you know, the the community feelings on this are going to play a, a significant role in how we're going to think about the site selection piece as well. Okay. Good. Oh, yes. Mr. Chairman, I have a couple of questions for Mr. Cox. Does he have a presentation or, or is it, are we done? Let's hold and, that until okay. Mr. Cox presents. Uh, yesterday, we heard a, a presentation on advanced nuclear tech and SMR, and they mentioned thorium. W are we using thorium or do can we? So thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the question. Um, our reactor will run on uranium. Uh, you know, uh, we don't have plans on using thorium. We early in its in its um, in the start of our company, we did look at thorium as a potential solution. There's some advantages to thorium. There's some disadvantages to, to thorium. Um, the reason, one of the the biggest reasons we're not using thorium for this particular reactor is that there's there's not a thorium industry that could stand up to kind of provide the fuel and the time frame that that we would need. Um, I think you know, personally. Uh, I like I like uranium. It's a it's a very uh, uh, it's it, it's a good it's a good uh, uh, fuel for us for for a lot of reasons, and you know our reactor does operate in the fast spectrum, which is uh, means it doesn't need a moderator to slow the neutrons down to achieve the critical reaction. And a lot of the benefits that get touted about thorium reactors can actually be achieved with um, uranium fast reactors, like the reduction of waste volumes uh, uh, and the like. Uh, oh, Representative Burkhardt has a question. Yeah, no surprise. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. So maybe a too technical of a question, and maybe we could take this offline. Uh, for your fuel, are you using any of the current, call it advanced uh, fuel designs like Halo and Treso and those? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the question. Thank you, uh, Representative Burkhardt. Yeah, we, we will use a high assay, low enriched uranium okay. or HALU. Um, uh, which is re which is required because we are a fast reactor, like I just mentioned. It's a more efficient way to use to, uh, to use to use the fuel. Uh, we will have to fabricate, you know, new fuel pins, new fuel forms that are going to be different than what are what are currently available. Although um, that's a process that happens with most reactors; they all seem to differ um, uh, a, a little bit. So we will use Halu as our input, and we will manufacture our uh, the, the the we'll do the fuel fabrication as well, and and then um, that will go into the reactor to fuel the reactor. Mr. Navin, uh, State of Wyoming has been a big producer of U two thirty eight for all the 70s and right up till 81 when we when we discontinued uh and right now we're not producing any the industry says they can produce possibly about 20 million pounds a year of course we hope that this plant would use some of that um, uh, some of it would go to the rest of the nation also but uh, that also has to be enriched which we don't have an enrichment plant in right. Wyoming nor in the United States. So right. would we have a way of knowing that we were using our own uh, uranium if it went to the enrichment plant? I mean, you well, can't... you know, I mean, uh, I, I don't think there's a way we could look at it and say that's Wyoming uranium, but um, um, we, we do we do hope that the development of this technology and the development of subsequent reactors creates sufficient demand that it restarts the uranium industry, not just in Wyoming, but broadly through the United States. Uh, this reactor that we're building will use about um, 12 metric tons, just to give us a sense, a sense of the scale. Um, the biggest, one of the biggest challenges we have in terms of our supply chain is, as you mentioned, there is currently not enrichment capacity in the United States for the high assay, low enriched uranium or the HALU that we talked about. Uh, we have made an investment in a facility in Ohio uh, run by a company called Centris, who's working to build that capacity. We're working with your federal delegation. Senator Brasso actually has some proposals that he's put forward to create a HALU bank 
which would allow the US government to buy HALU for these projects, and then we would buy it from the bank. So there'd be no cost to the taxpayers, but it could kind of stimulate and jumpstart the ability to bring that enrichment capability online. And that enricher would have to buy you know, uranium. They'd be highly incentivized to use domestic uranium because of the, the cost advantages. So um, uh, you know, we are actively looking at options that we have to purchase HALU. We would, for all of the reasons that you can probably imagine, would much prefer to have that HALU come from trusted domestic sources uh, within our borders. Um, and so uh, we're working with, with the federal delegation um, and the Department of Energy and some of the other US companies to try to bring that, that to fruition. Um, HALU's, HALU keeps us up at night. How we get the fuel for this reactor is one of the things that we're gonna have to figure out because as Representative Burkhart pointed out, seven years is, uh, is warp speed when it comes to, to nuclear. So, um, uh, you know, we've had uh, initial, some good initial meetings with the, 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 mine, the Uranium Mining Association here in Wyoming. Um, we want to be a good neighbor to them too, and a good partner uh, to them because we're gonna we're gonna need we're gonna need their their uh, their product as we continue to build these reactors out uh, across the country. We are very concerned that some of our enemies want to produce uh, your your halo and sell it to you at a discount due to the government uh, supporting that in the beginning and cutting the Wyoming producers out of that. So. We're very concerned about that. Great. Well, thank, Mr. Chairman, I will say I think I think Senator Brasso's um, Halo Bank idea would be a really good way to to solve that problem. Um, good. Uh, we we share as would any company. Um, if you've got critical parts of your supply chain and you're relying on on foreign producers that don't have the best interests of the United States at heart all of the time. Um, you know, we certainly want to make sure that we've got access to, to a solid domestic supply of, of our uranium. Other questions for Mr. Navin? We'll move on to Mr. Cox. <clears throat> and Mr. Chair, I'm, I'm cognizant of time. I, I will just be brief to say uh, the, the source of my comments today, I, I did want to mention that uh, to accommodate a project of this nature, uh, there, there would be uh, needed uh, or it needed to be some, some changes uh, to Wyoming state code. So first of all, there, there was a bill that was passed in, in the year uh, 2020 uh, that essentially had this idea before we had this idea. So, you know, we, uh, we, we uh, are, are certainly thankful for, for that uh, impetus there. And, and, and that particular bill, it was HB 74, that uh, essentially allowed for uh, uh, an otherwise retiring coal plant uh, facility or site to, to be used uh, for a small modular nuclear reactor. Um, this isn't small modular. And so the, the nomenclature there certainly needs to be changed as well. Uh, an item in that bill uh, caps the size of a nuclear facility at 300 megawatts. This is obviously a little bit larger than that. So another change that would need to be made. Um, also in, in state statute, uh, there's requirements for us to go through a process uh, to attempt to sell an otherwise retiring coal plant. Uh, in this particular case, if a site is selected, uh, and, and subsequently, years down the road, we have to try to sell that. Um, that could create some issues that, that we would need to work through in advance. Um, so those are just a few items. We continue to uh, review uh, state code on this, this item. Uh, that review is in process. Uh, we've been working with folks uh, from the governor's office, and, uh, and, and certainly we'll work with this committee um, at the appropriate time as we identify each of those items. But I did wanna flag that in statute, a few things would need to be uh, changed to accommodate this particular project. Mr. Cox, help me understand, it's not a small nuclear reactor? Uh, Mr. Chair, it is a small nuclear reactor. The issue is that word modular. Um, and, and Mr. Navin can kick me if I, I go astray here a little bit, but uh, uh, the, the modular uh, nomenclature there is, is typically referenced for a, a nuclear facility like the new scale facility that they're proposing there in, in Idaho that you could build out at whatever scale you wanted. You just add another module. Uh, th this is different. So the, the size that we're talking about, you couldn't just add an additional additional 80 megawatts if you wanted it. Um, so both are advanced nuclear reactors. One is modular, the other is not. Okay. All right. Representative Gray, I think you had a question. Thanks, uh, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate it. So I had a couple uh, HB 74. I originally I voted against that and uh, it went through it was 56 to 4, 29 1. And one of the big reasons was one. 
the questions on what this would actually become, it was clear that this was being used to replace a coal-fired power plant. And uh, that's, that's really concerning to me. So can you talk about, I mean, the Glenrock situation, seven years, I mean, that would, that would speed up the closure of the Glenrock facility, would it not? Mr. Chair and Representative Gray, uh, so as this committee well knows, we're uh, proceeding with a, a schedule of coal plant retirements um, irrespective of this project. And, and we've had that discussion for the last two years. We've had some rough and tumble conversations in those two years, and I, I fully expect those to continue. Uh, but I, I do just want to be clear on that point that that, that is, is moving forward uh, for, from our planning purposes, at least, irrespective of this, this conversation. To your second question, Representative Gray, on timeline, um, our current depreciable life for uh, that particular power plant uh, is 2027. And so it, it could be in line if you're talking seven years from now, 2028, uh, for a particular project like this. You have more questions? All right, Senator, Senator Cooper. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, this is going to sound a little awkward, and, and it's it's not meant to be, but I I like the idea of the of the technology and developing it. I think it's something that the nation needs, that the state needs. But the perception with Rocky Mountain Power and closing these plants across the state is that Rocky Mountain Power is no longer a friend of Wyoming. Uh, you're asking us to to adopt adapt our language to uh, to support this project <clears throat> other than this project how what kind of commitment can we get from Rocky Mountain Power to to either sell these uh, additional plants or to um, to seek other alternatives other than closing these plants as far as uh, moving forward with carbon capture, those types of, of uh, those types of technologies. Yeah, Mr. Chair and, and Senator Cooper, uh, you, you do have our commitment to, to work with you. Um, I, I, I bristle a little bit there, that characterization. I, I, I hope you'll forgive me for that, but we've been partners with the state of Wyoming for a good 100 years, and we'd like to continue that. And I, I, I hope the state of Wyoming feels the same way. I, I know it's a difficult time, not just in Wyoming, but across the country on this issue. Um, I would say, you know, we are bringing this as one solution in good faith to, to try to bring jobs to local Wyoming communities uh, where we have employees who have powered this state and powered the West for generations. And we'd like to continue that in the state of Wyoming, whether that solution is nuclear, whether that solution is potentially a, a conversion of a coal-fired uh, facility to natural gas or other things, we analyze all of those in our planning process. Mr. Chair, yes. Um, again, I I personally really like the idea of, of developing this, but I, the perception from the people that I talk to um, is that Rocky Mountain Power is no longer a good friend of Wyoming. Uh, that you're turning your back on us. Um, this is not turning your back on us. This is developing an alternative. But these, these same people are asking us, why can't, instead of going nuclear, why can't we extend, find um, alternatives to closing these plants, whether that be selling them, um, whatever the alternatives may be. The people that I'm talking to that, that are talking to me don't feel that uh, Rocky Mountain Power has really stepped up to the table and, and um, looked at all the alternatives to closing these plants. So how can I, I guess we'd like some more information from Rocky Mountain Power as, as far as what you can give back other than a nuclear plant. Um, the the uh, industrial customers, the oil and gas producers are or uh, needing alternatives to um, to Rocky Mountain Power, and it's not there. And um, I, I guess, uh, like I said, I, I, I don't mean to bristle you, but um, this perception across the state from a lot of the people is that that you have turned your back on us, and we'd like to see something more in return. Is what is what I'm hearing from from my people. Thank you, sir. 
Mr. Cox. Yeah, Mr. Chair and, and Senator Cooper, I, I appreciate the sentiment and and I, uh, I I don't you know intend to disagree or 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 anything of that nature here. I, I would say uh, this is not an insignificant project <laughs> that we're talking about here today. Um, there there are coal plants that are closing across this country, and there are communities that are devastated across this country. Um, we we get that, <laughs> we we see that. Um, we we don't just have coal plants in the state of Wyoming. We have coal plants across six Western states, and we're seeing this in every last one of them. Um, we're, we're trying to, to find ways to help these communities, um, and, and we're trying to find ways to help our employees. Um, I, I hope that this particular effort, this particular project is not seen as insignificant. Uh, and, and certainly this is one piece of the conversation, but there's, there's others as well. Mr. Cox, we don't mean to attack your company, but there is a lot of, lot of angst in the in the state about losing jobs, obviously. How many how many employees do you have in the state? Uh, I can get the exact number, and I, I think, uh, Mr. Chair, in, in previous presentations, I've actually had that on a, on a deck I've had. It's, uh, I believe, just over a thousand employees. Uh, but we've got the four coal plants in the states. Uh, we obviously have a significant number of employees on our poles and wires, our transmission and distribution. Um, we own one coal mine in the state associated with our Jim Bridger plant as well. So we, we have a significant number of employees. When you look at our six states in which we have customers and, you know, Rocky Mountain, or excuse me, Wyoming accounts for about 16% of the electricity that we sell in those six states. But you look at the number of employees I have and you divide it, Wyoming is far, far higher than 16%. You know, Wyoming is an exporter of energy. Um, it always has been, and we're looking for ways to help that continue to be the case. We believe this project is one example of that. Okay. Representative Burkhardt has a question. So kind of two divergent questions. One being, wherever you cite this in seven, eight years, you will lose people at that plant. They'll retire. They'll decide to go somewhere else. I mean, uh, you know, attrition is just a... a part of doing business. Would it be your intention, and I'm not asking for a commitment to, as those jobs become available to offer them to existing employees who have those skills or, or are trainable in those skills? So that, that's the first one. The divergent one is you mentioned New Scale, and New Scale had kind of a consortium agreement with Utah and Idaho to supply some communities over there uh, with a small modular reactor, and they've tended to back out. Um, they're reconsidering their costs and everything else. Any intention potentially of leveraging this to fill that portion to supply power to those two areas? Mr. Chair and Representative Burkhardt, uh, to answer both questions, uh, to the first question on employees, um, as you look at the different sites where we have coal plants today, and you think about the number of jobs that will be needed, as Mr. Navin uh, said in his testimony, um, we, we've got to have a, a significant number of our current employees, you know, looking there, or we've got to bring in, you know, and, and recruit employees from, from out of the area. I would say our preference is to find employees that we have today, if retraining is necessary to do that retraining and, uh, and, and help them, them find jobs in, in this new nuclear facility. To your second question on uh, new scale, uh, we are aware of, of that uh, particular uh, power plants, uh, the partnership that you mentioned with some, some cities there in Utah. You mentioned uh, cities had pulled out, so some had, but there's still quite a few, I think, that are participants in that project. That certainly is something we, we have looked at for some time and will continue to look at. I will say something that's different about this technology that Mr. Navin mentioned that, that I hope we don't underestimate is the importance of the storage capability that has not been done uh, by any nuclear facility before. And the value of that in a grid that has an increasing amount of intermittent generation is especially valuable. Um, so you're building a 345 megawatt plant, but you can use it at 500 megawatts um, whenever you need it, You know, again, for up to five and a half hours. That is significant. That, that is really a game changer in this conversation for us. He's done. Hmm. You? Uh, obviously, we're going to need your input on on what we need to change to make you successful in Wyoming with a, another energy source, uh, and we hope to get that done this interim so we can introduce that uh, in the next session. Obviously, there will be some people that don't agree with that, but that that's always the case. Uh, anything else? Anything else from you? No, I, I think. Yes, 
Senator Westberger. So my question is, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, so you're mentioning a number of different sites which, which that you were looking at in Wyoming. Can you take us through the process that you were going to use to pick uh, one of those sites, or are you going to put, or are you actually thinking about putting uh, power plants in all four sites? Yeah, Mr. Chair and Senator Wasserberger. Uh, so we're looking for for one one site. So uh, the, the the four locations that uh, we're looking at right now are the four locations where we have uh, power plants today. Um, I would say not not every site is created equal for a variety of reasons. So Mr. Navin had mentioned some of those things that we would look out uh, look at, you know, infrastructure, geologic issues, et cetera. Um, one of the other things that I think has been flagged today in, in some of the comments back and forth is also coal plant retirement dates. So, you know, we have some of our plants that are retiring sooner than others. You know, we have one of the plants in consideration that doesn't retire or isn't scheduled to retire until 2039. That probably isn't the best fit for this first project. Uh, but even so, having this discussion with these local communities, I think is helpful to, to gauge whether there is interest in this first project, but also if there's a subsequent project down the road, and we hope there is in the, in the very near future, would that community be open to the second site or the third site? And so we'll, we'll go through that process again. We've got to make a decision by the end of the year. We'd like to make it sooner. Uh, rather than later, but those those communications and those those meetings are taking place right now. We'll have, uh, you know, I think four of them next week as well, and, and we'll continue until a decision is made. Take care of it, Mr. Senator Westberg. Oh, yes, Representative Gray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, you know, we've asked this, this is the third time we talked about the process, but what I'm trying to get at is, is there an objective criterion, like a scorecard that you're going to publish? Is there an objective criterion you're going to use that's going to be public? So um, thank you for the question. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative Gray. Um, there are some things that are like pretty important, right? We have to get the site licensed by the NRC. So part of the evaluation is going to look at, for example, the geology under the site. Um, is it going to be able to sustain and support this plan? Is it going to be able to be something that we can we can get licensed? There are other criteria that are going to be pretty firm as well. I imagine looking at, for example, congestion on the grid at particular sites and making sure that that if we produce the power, that there's grid capacity to take that power off and deliver it deliver it to customers. But some of those less objective things, like you mentioned, community support, that matters to us too, right? If if, if a community doesn't want this plant in that community, we're gonna take, you know, we'll, we'll certainly take that into, into consideration. Um, we don't have a, uh, you know, sort of a, a scorecard, if you will, we're gonna grade on these 15 criteria and add it up and, and you know, whoever gets the highest score wins. Um, and as, 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 as John mentioned, you know, um, obviously we as TerraPower would love to build the second plan or the third plan or the fourth plan. Um, you know, uh, here as well. So thinking about the out, leaving those opportunities, which communities have the greatest need from an economic development and jobs point of view, we'll take that into consideration um, as well. So um, I, 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 I'm trying to be clear and transparent that there are some objective, that some very clear black and white objective things that we have to look at to make sure we can get that particular site licensed. But there are some of these other things that are more, that are less objective, if you will, that we're going to take into consideration so that the feelings of local people at the community, make sure that if there are objections that we take that into consideration. And also, um, you know, as John mentioned, if, if you, a plant that has a, a the coal plant is gonna operate until 2039, um, we've got a little more time to think through what a potential solution could be for that community versus one that's gonna, you know, close in the late, late 2020s. I don't think we have any more questions. We've Question you quite a bit. I think we'll hold off on on uh, doing any drafts legislation until we hear from you what things you need. You need that modular reactor removed, and you need the cap removed on that. But there's probably other things too that we should be looking at. So if if we could, maybe next meeting we could get the rest of those, and and uh, we could get to work on them then. So with that, we're going to see if there's, a, oh, we have another another speaker. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Mr. Thank Cox you. and Mr. Navin. Uh, Sarah Fitzgerald is going to talk to us from the Business Council. 
Uh, just, uh, Mr. Chairman, sir, were you going to speak on this subject, or were you going to speak on the carbon credit? Oh, not Bank. on this subject, on carbon credits. What's that? Carbon credits. That's what I thought. Yeah. I thought we had you mislabeled. So oh. I, I think uh, our, our chairman needs to take public comment to take a break. Thank and then you. we move on to the, <laughs> the carbon credits. Thank you, Sarah. That was, that was very good. We'll just move you right down there. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, any public comment on this uh, subject, on the nuclear power generation in Wyoming subject? Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, uh, Travis Detai with the Wyoming Mining Association. Uh, putting on the uranium hat today. Um, before I get started, I would like to, yeah, I am often uh, in front of the committee with doom and gloom, and I wanted to share just something of, of, of a conversation I had last night. Uh, at dinner, I ran into one of our managers at the Bentonite plant here uh, in, uh, in Casper, and I asked how things were going, and uh, he told me that they are going to be probably having the best year they've ever had. So it's not all doom and gloom in the industry, and I want to just uh, share good news when I can. Um, and that is good news. So uh, their main product is cat litter. So keep buying cats and support your bentonite industry. Um, this is a big deal. And uh, I, I will tell you that uh, uh, the folks at Terra Power and Rocky Mountain Power reached out to uh, the uranium operators prior to the announcement. We sat down, had a little conversation. And when the announcement was made, um, we had uh, uh, representatives from all nine of our uranium companies in Wyoming. Uh, it was met with applause. Our guys are very excited about this. Um, if we are able to get this up, up and off the ground and working um, and build more, that's going to increase demand and that demand can be met by Wyoming uranium producers. Uh, in the uh, state of the industry today is dreadful. Um, we mined 27,000 pounds of, uh, uh, of uranium last year. And, and to put that in perspective, that's down from about 12 million pounds a year back in the 1970s. Uh, our producers in, uh, in, in Wyoming employ 120 people, down from 5,300 back in the 1970s. So the industry's on its back, and it's on its back for a number of reasons. Obviously, the price is, uh, uh, the, the market has been flooded by state-sponsored uranium. We cannot compete right now. Uh, this body has been very helpful with giving us some, some tax, uh, tax help on the, on the severance tax side, and that is helping. Um, of our companies right now, we had four that were actually producing last year, um, but again, 27,000 uh, pounds, that's negligible. It's the lowest on record, and that is... Uh, American uranium production right there. That's it. Um, so we see the opportunity here to get uh, get this project up and running. Um, it will increase demand. Uh, in discussions with Terra Power and Rocky Mountain Power, one of the things that came up is we see this as a market indicator. And I think for, for investment uh, uh, purposes for our operators, and I think they're seeing some of that come to fruition already. Um, we get this up and running, the demand's gonna be there. Our operators are ready, as uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, as you noted, we can turn right around and, and up our capacity to 20 million pounds. We can do more, uh, you, know, you know, that's 20, 20 million pounds with our in situ mining process that we use today. We can, if, if the need is there, we can go to conventional mining and mine more. We can do it. Um, I also think this is a tremendous opportunity right now uh, this is the signal that the United States is back on the nuclear playing field when we've been on the sidelines for the last 50 years. Uh, the opportunity uh, for the state of Wyoming um, to get into the enrichment game, hell, let's build some of these facilities here and let's do it here and let's, let's do the whole fuel cycle here in Wyoming. Um, food for thought, I think there's, uh, again, tremendous opportunity. And this doesn't have to be at the expense of your work uh, at holding Rocky Mountain Power's feet to the fire on coal. Uh, we can walk and chew gum at the same time. We can continue our work on carbon capture and technology and use the coal resource, keep it viable in the future, and we can pursue this. And I will keep uh, on Rocky Mountain Power to tear down those windmills. 
because this is <laughs> because this is what uh, this is clean energy, and this is reliable energy. This is dispatchable energy, and uh, you know that's if that's what we're doing. If this car, if this uh, emissions thing is really the ex ex existential crisis it's meant to be, here is something that solves the problem and fits the bill. So. Uh, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the project has the full support of the Wyoming uranium industry, and uh, we look forward to, to carrying through on this project. And I would stand for questions. Any questions for Mr. Detay? Uh, Chuck, yes, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Okay, Chairman. Great. Mr. Detay, have you thought at all about the, uh, the use of the bonding authority for a coal export terminal? We were talking about that yesterday. Have your members thought at all about that? We had that that testimony on the bonding authority for uh, for the state and state statute. Mr. Chairman, um, let me put my coal hat back on. Uh, anything that the state can do, any authority that the state can do to uh, to make that happen, you know, we're obviously supportive of Representative Gray. Other questions for Mr. Detay? Thank you, Mr. Detay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for coming. Bye, cats. Any other public public testimony, public comment, <coughs> public anything? Hearing none, we'll close public comment, and we're going to take a short break. Uh, about uh, we'll reconvene about ten minutes till eleven.
It's 1050 somewhere. No, we don't. Oh, is it Barker? No, we don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> See if uh, there's any more legislators out there. They really, they really got lost. Well, we're out of donuts. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of a tragedy, kind of an emergency. There's no more. There is it? No. Turn to answer. No, it's, there's a half of one. <laughs> I left you a half. Right yeah. No. no way in the box. In the box is a half of one. And I should take it. Kip Holly's in uh, DC this week. Is that? No, she's on her way back. Yeah. Oh, way back. yeah. She was going to skip her trip to be here, and I thought Scott can have it. Mr. Baker, Mr. Baker, Mr. Baker, could you see if there's any legislators out there that are, are did did um, is your agenda say Sarah's working with? Yeah, so Sarah, Sarah's kind of got the lead as I understand it. Oh, yeah. Kip's, yeah. But what is your agenda say? I don't know, Brian. Did you want to, Brian? Did you want to give an overview on our research memo? That that's that's up to you. Yeah. So I didn't know. You know, Brian had put this together. It'd be better if Brian gave a little bit of an. We're we're kind of free forming here on this topic. Yeah. Would you like Brian to go ahead and go through his memorandum? I think that Brian. I think that was set the stage or. And and Mr. Chairman, that was actually Clarissa who oh, put that I'm together. So Ms. Norton will okay. discuss that. Yeah. Uh, what? Why don't we, Mr. Chairman? Why don't we have them do that? Have them, yeah, have her go them. through her memo. Just kind of. Uh, oh, have her do it or no, yeah. Clarissa who put this oh. together. Okay. Yeah. Right. And that may set the table for those two to come in. So. I think I think we've reached a quorum, so we'll go ahead and and call this meeting to order. And first order of business here is the staff is going to tell us about this research that they did on the thing. Clarissa, are you ready? Mr. Chairman, I am. Thank you very okay. much. All right. um, my name is Clarissa Nord, and I'm an associate research analyst with the Legislative Service Office. Um, I'll just be providing a few key highlights from the memo that's included in your meeting materials. Um, for your reference, it's labeled as Appendix 9-01 if you'd like to pull that up. Um, so this memo just provides some introductory information regarding several carbon offset approaches, and it also summarizes other states' uh, market-based climate policies. And so generally speaking, uh, market-based climate policies exist um, just as one way to address greenhouse gas emissions, and um, these policies establish a financial incentive um, for companies to innovate and develop lower emitting technologies. And then they also provide greater flexibility um, for entities to achieve environmental goals at lower overall costs. And so just getting into a couple of definitions here with respect to um, carbon offsets, an offset broadly refers to a measurable reduction, avoidant or avoidance or sequestration of emissions that occur in another location. Um, and then these programs enable both the public and private sectors to trade offsets in the form of credits um, that typically represent one ton of carbon dioxide equivalent emissions. And so offsets are generated by projects completed to intentionally reduce emissions and um, they can have objectives like preserving and maintaining forests um, or supporting methane reduction projects, but there's um, a wide variety of projects that can make up an offset. And then in terms of uh, carbon allowances, uh, these are tradable credits that permit a certain amount of emissions throughout the wider economy. Um, and so allowances differ from offsets in that government entities issue them through um, cap and trade programs. Um, and in turn, they limit the supply of the allowances, which creates scarcity in the market. And so because allowances are both tradable and scarce, this places an indirect price on carbon. 
Um, and then regulated sectors can either purchase allowances depending on their circumstances, um, or they can sell them if they have excess and create a new revenue stream. Um, and allowances also just establish another method um, uh, to carbon offsets for claiming emissions reductions and governments originally designed them um, to mitigate carbon offset project quality issues and concerns. Um, and then for carbon markets, these address uh, these exist to address environmental goals, uh, most commonly to reduce greenhouse gas emissions cost effectively. And um, in terms of the history of carbon markets, the Kyoto Protocol, which is an international treaty the UN adopted in uh, 1997, first recognized the role of carbon markets for climate mitigation. And so uh, two types of carbon markets exist, um, both voluntary and compliance. So for voluntary markets, um, individuals and companies can independently purchase uh, carbon offset credits um, to attain their own environmental goals. Uh, where um, for compliance markets, um, this is um, where governments actually regulate the market and uh, place uh, a cap on emissions. And so, put differently, government entities regulate compliance markets, while um, typically third party registries, um, like the Climate Action Reserve is just one example, um, manage voluntary markets. And then just briefly getting into other states' market-based climate policies. Um, so 13 states in the District of Columbia have implemented a variety of market-based climate policies. Um, and these focus on limiting emissions from major portions of the economy. And so these policies can be carried out at the state level as we see with California, or they can be carried out through regional agreements. Um, so in terms of regional agreements, uh, there's two that currently exist in the United States, the first being the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. And um, this one focuses on limiting emissions from the power sector. And then the second one is the Transportation and Climate Initiative, and this targets reductions in the transportation sector. And then for um, finally state initiatives, so two states administer their own um, climate initiatives. So California uh, is unique in that it regulates multiple sectors um, through a statewide program where uh, Massachusetts manages a program to reduce emissions from electricity generating facilities. And then for recent legislative action, um, Hawaii considered implementing an in-state cap and trade program in 2019, and their legislature has since considered uh, various uh, legislation regarding offsets. And then just recently here in uh, May 2021, Washington's legislature enacted the Climate Commitment Act. And this requires the state to develop a cap and invest program beginning in 2023. Um, so Mr. Chairman, that completes uh, my brief remarks um, summarizing the memo and I'm happy to stand for any questions you all may have. Any questions for Clarissa? Yes. Uh, oops. Representative Bear. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you for that uh, overview. Was there any uh, research done on this new 45Q that was mentioned earlier today? And can you share anything you know about 45Q? Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Bear, you know, I, I did not look at that, um, the 45Q um, information, but I'd be happy to follow up and uh, provide that to you. Yes, Representative Greer. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I actually think Mr. Coddington could probably get you some ready-made research on 45Q pretty quickly. Uh, I did have, you know, so um, cap and trade's been a dirty word in Wyoming. <laughs> I, I think that uh, what we're looking at is is uh, investment and trade uh, type of components as we go forward, just to make that clear to um, our audience. So, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Other questions? Other questions for Ms. Ford? Other questions? Hearing none, thank you for your thank you for your research. And, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And the, and the input. Uh, next up is uh, Sarah Fitzgerald and Kip Coddington, please.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the committee. My name is Sarah Fitzgerald. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer at the Wyoming Business Council. I'm joined today by Kip Coddington from the School of Energy Resources. He's the real expert, um, but we're here today to continue the conversation that Clarissa started around um, carbon markets and carbon trading. Um, I wanna, um, before we jump in, wanna also clarify as uh, Co-Chairman Greer said, um, the work that we've started um, is A, only just begun, and B, um, primarily focused on those voluntary carbon markets um, that Ms. Nord talked about, not the regulatory or compliance markets. Um, and so in nowhere in here will you hear about um, regulating emissions or anything like that. Um, we're, we're talking about um, market opportunities that could be, um, that, that could be beneficial for Wyoming. Um, so I've got a slide deck, if we can pull that up. Thanks, and we can go on to the next slide. Awesome, thank you. Um, so today we're just we're just starting the conversation with all of you. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the approach that we're taking, um, as well as what little bit we've learned so far. Um, uh, and Kip will talk about some more background, complementing uh, what Ms. Nord shared, um, and then we'll talk about next steps. And as part of that, um, we can have a discussion about how to work together going forward. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Kip Coddington. We've got a place for this slide. Thank you, Sarah. So, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, my name is Kip Coddington. I'm the director of the Center for Energy Regulation and Policy Analysis, SERPA, at the School of Energy Resources at the University of Wyoming. SERPA conducts Wyoming focused interdisciplinary energy policy assessments. I'm also a co principal investigator on the Wyoming Carbon Safe Project up in Gillette. In that role, I lead the project's legal, regulatory, policy, economic, and outreach aspects. It is my privilege to testify this morning on carbon credits and carbon markets, then answer any questions that you may have. I spent most of my legal career dealing with this topic to include living in London for a stint where I represented an investment firm that did carbon market transactions. So I'm testifying today from decades of commercial experience in this area. My testimony is divided into four topics. First, what is a carbon credit? Second, what is a carbon market? Third, I wanna highlight some key aspects of both carbon credits and carbon markets that are important. And fourth, I will conclude with why I think carbon credits and markets are relevant for Wyoming. First though, what is a carbon credit? And again, I would like to commend the excellent research done, uh, done by LSO staff. Um, so as I will explain later, carbon credit means different things to different people and precise language is important. In general, however, a carbon credit is a reduction in greenhouse gases typically expressed in carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide equivalents or CO2E that is recognized by law or regulation as part of a government management program or done voluntarily. A key point about carbon credits is that they must be real, permanent, quantifiable, verifiable, enforceable, and additional. And I wanna focus on the concept of additionality here. Additionality means that you cannot receive a financial benefit for something that you are already required to do. So if your power plant is required to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions under the Federal Clean Air Act, you cannot also sell carbon credits for those same reductions. Additionality means you are generating carbon credits because you are taking additional effort to reduce your emissions. So you should be compensated for that extra effort via the carbon markets. In contrast, if a company is just engaged in business as usual operations and hoping to generate extra revenue on the side via carbon credits, that will never be approved or allowed to happen. Generating carbon credits, no matter the type, takes effort, time, and money. Carbon credits are not free money. Carbon credits do have value just like a currency, but their value varies wildly. The value of a carbon credit depends upon a host of factors from supply and demand to project type and credit quality. Credits also have vintages and they can be temporary. Forests, for example, burn down from time to time, as we all know. But that fire also re-releases the absorbed CO2, some of which may have been previously reflected in a carbon credit 
somewhere. So issued credits can be retroactively invalidated. All of these factors influence the value or price. There is also limited price transparency on carbon credits. And again, it depends on what you mean by carbon credits. The Wall Street Journal doesn't publish pricing data on carbon credits. California does periodically publish pricing and auction data for allowances. And I'll explain later what an allowance is. Clues about pricing for carbon credits could be obtained from registries such as the American Carbon Registry, but registration is required. Generally, market consultants and participants would have to be consulted to provide insights as to value and pricing. I view pricing information about carbon credits as similar to pricing information for carbon dioxide for enhanced oil recovery. Both are really difficult to ascertain from the outside unless you are a party to the transaction. And much of that pricing is bilateral and subject to an infinite number of variables. There is no doubt that carbon credits are legally real, however. They can be transacted via contracts known as emission reduction purchase agreements. You can issue loans for them. In London, I did carbon market, carbon loan deals. We would issue a loan in currency and we were paid back in carbon credits that we then monetized in the London carbon markets. You can take a security interest in carbon credits. Accountants know how to account for them. For example, they are generally deemed to be intangible assets, although there are uncertainties on the accounting side. The Federal Trade Commission has green guides that also have a section on carbon credits. Those green guides prohibit and regulate false marketing claims about carbon credits. ESG investors are now talking a lot about these topics, and thanks to Professor Ben Cook at the UW College of Business, we have potential revenues from carbon credits built into our business model for Wyoming Carbon Safe. So that concludes my um, comments about what a carbon credit is. Now I'm going to pivot to the second topic. What is a carbon market? One, one yes. question here. One question here. Just to slow you down. Okay. Okay. And we're going too quickly, <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Apologize. I'm a quick drinker. But okay. Damn. <laughs> no, uh, Mr. Connington. Uh, so just sort of an uh, you know an overlying, real simplistic. Uh, thought process and it's being built into carbon safe is because we don't have a cap on the emissions um, for the power plants in Wyoming. I mean, these decisions are being driven by the market out there, but if, if we're able to bolt on carbon capture and that is sequestered, okay, um, and, and I know enhanced oil recovery or the use for that's a little different mechanism, but it's truly sequestered, that can be built into the business model as a revenue source if we have a framework, a regulatory framework to help define the value. Is that a, is that a fair statement or? Yes, Mr. Chairman, point? although I think to a certain extent that framework already exists. So, and, and I'll explain that in a, in a moment. So, but yes, Mr. Chairman, that's exactly right. But we proactively have that carbon value built into the, business model for Wyoming carbon safe, even though there are still uncertainties around precisely how that might work. And I apologize, I'm going to You quickly. go uh, at any speed you feel good about, Mr. Coddington. <laughs> okay, so what is a carbon market? That gets to the next issue. What are carbon markets? Carbon credits are almost always used in two different types of carbon markets. The first is a regulated or a compliance carbon market, and the second is a voluntary carbon market. Uh, I'm going to talk more about regula uh, regulated carbon markets, but I won't because I understand now that that is not the focus here. But generally, the credits with the greatest value are used in markets where greenhouse gases are regulated. Um, so in our region, if you want to generate the highest value for your carbon credit, do something that qualifies in California. Um, the other type of market are, are voluntary carbon markets, which I'm, which I'm pivoting to now. So a voluntary carbon market refers to everything else, i.e. those are individuals or companies that are voluntarily reducing their greenhouse gas emissions or otherwise looking for market opportunities. These voluntary credits are generally created via project or technology specific methodologies that are published or recognized by market makers or registries. 
These credits tend to have lower values because of the absence, because of the absence of a government agency creating market demand. There, are none, there nonetheless is demand for voluntary carbon credits. To generate a voluntary carbon credit, you have to comply with a relevant methodology. Methodologies are fairly complex and project type rule books that explain in great detail the steps, including verification, to be followed to generate and verify a carbon credit. When I was running the North American Carbon Capture and Storage Association, we hired a consulting firm to develop a methodology for CO2 storage via EOR. And that methodology was accepted by the relevant registry and is still in use today. So Mr. Chairman, if Wyoming Carbon Safe wanted to generate voluntary carbon credits via EOR, that rule book exists and those credits could be generated tomorrow. If, if a methodology doesn't exist for your project type, you can endeavor to create your own that just takes time, money, and there's no guarantee that that methodology will ultimately be accepted by the market. Voluntary carbon markets are of immediate relevance for Wyoming. Again, if I wanted to generate a voluntary carbon credit here tomorrow, I, the most efficient way thing that I would do is I would go out and find an existing methodology that is recognized by a registry, then I would implement it, and there would be a multitude of consultants and lawyers that would be available to assist me. There's always lawyers available to assist. Um, I just um, almost done here. I want to third, what are some key aspects of carbon credits and carbon markets are important? First, this topic is not new. Carbon credits and carbon markets have been around for decades. They are always evolving, of course, but there is nothing really new about their fundamentals. However, driven by ESG investing, Paris Agreement goals, the UN SDGs and other activities, these markets are continually expanding both in terms of geography and subject matter. And of course that then creates um, opportunities for the good folks here in Wyoming. Second, as I hinted out previously, the term carbon credit is not legally precise. In other contexts, you would use terms such as allowance, offset credit, voluntary emission reduction under the Paris Agreement. The Paris Agreement uses a term called internationally transferred mitigation outcomes or ITMOs. I could go on and on. And it's a literally a literal alphabet soup of terms that are used. Just know that carbon credit is not legally precise, but people use it. Um, third, the Federal Clean Air Act regulates a whole group of greenhouse gases. The primary ones are carbon dioxide and methane, of course, but there are but there are others. So for example, there probably is a market out there for nitrous oxide credits. Um, there probably is, and if there is, I'm unaware of it. Just know carbon credits are not always dealing with carbon dioxide. Fourth, units of measure are important. As I indicated, the typical unit of measure for a carbon credit is carbon dioxide equivalents, but it may just be tons of CO2. So you have to read carefully and, and understand what is being implemented in, in the market. And fifth, carbon credits are not tax credits. So carbon credits have nothing to do with a section 45Q credit, which is a tax credit. Carbon credits are or non-tax items. And then my final thought, I want to conclude on why carbon markets, why carbon credits and markets are relevant for Wyoming. Um, and the answer is yes. So carbon credits and markets are all about identifying market opportunities to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the most efficient way possible. And um, and we are, as a major energy exporter, we're, we all know we're exporting a lot of our energy to, to markets that are putting these types of programs in place. And this is a topic that the um, Energy Policy Center at SER is separately tracking and research, researching. So it's this is a relevant topic for us as, as an energy exporter. Um, we did do research. There actually are uh, at least three projects in Wyoming that already have have in the past or are currently generating voluntary carbon credits. 
Um, another potential interesting opportunity for, for Wyoming relates to carbon capture related credits. We, we've already hinted at that, Mr. Chairman, and, and we could talk about that at, at, at length. Um, so I think with that, I just wanted to identify four potential uh, areas, five actually, where I think additional research could be done and where the University of Wyoming might be able to, to assist. So more work could be done on what, what role could the state of Wyoming play in carbon markets? Um, what role could the addition of a carbon market here in Wyoming play in the export of our energy to other states? And again, we are separately looking at that through this Energy Policy Center. Thirdly, it, what project type methodologies don't exist? And if they did exist, they would benefit Wyoming based projects. So for example, to my knowledge, there is no voluntary methodology for sailing storage of CO2. The methodology that exists is limited to CO2 enhanced oil recovery. So it would be beneficial if we someone developed a methodology for CO2 and sailing storage. Um, fourthly, what activities are going on now in Wyoming that, if properly registered, could generate carbon credits? There's probably um, any, any number of items like that. Uh, and here we might look at the California Low Carbon Fuel Standard because the, their credits are of particular high, high value. Um, so with that, I think I'll stop there. This concludes my testimony, Mr. Chairman. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you or the committee may have. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Cottingham, Representative Greer. Mr. Cottington, I, uh, you know, this came out of some discussions uh, with folks who are, you know, they're looking at the, the harvesting of CO2 out of the atmosphere. They're looking at anything to, to reduce this. Understanding there's gonna be a high demand um, by industry for, you know, what they deem offsets. Um, I mean, it's, just face it, electric airplanes aren't going to happen for a while, <laughs> if, if ever. Um, and so they, I guess I look at how uh, innovative Wyoming was dealing with sage grouse. And then two years ago or three years ago, you know, we, we were able to put a statutory framework to ensure the integrity of that mitigation program in place. And so that coupled with Wyoming's forward thinking on uh, blockchain technology and then some of the banking surrounding that, which is being adopted by the FDIC, or um, it, it just got me to thinking that, and, and this was Representative Bear's idea actually for a, an interim topic was, you know, why can't we develop that framework here? And, and is that possible? And, would that then stimulate what we're attempting to do, which is to draw in more research, to draw in um, new projects. And so just kind of a 30,000 foot thought process of why we're having this discussion. And I'd just like to get your take on that. So Mr. Chairman and Representative Greer, yes, there certainly is uh, interesting opportunities here. Um, and those would need to be supported by a lot more research. And again, I would like to thank Ms. Fitzgerald for, for leading that. And again, commending the, the prior work that, that, that was done by LSO. Um, pieces of this do already exist. So we would have to be cognizant of what is already out there. Um, generally, uh, these are private sector actors that are working in voluntary markets as opposed to governmental entities, but that isn't to say there aren't um, additional work that could be done and roles for the state of Wyoming or state agencies uh, that could be pursued. I just think we would need to understand what the policy goal was, then we could support that with additional research and come back with some recommendations. Some questions? A follow up on that. Yeah, why don't you follow up? So I haven't had a chance to look it up, but I did uh, review um, Senator uh, Stabenow's uh, bill, which I understand has passed uh, the Senate anyway. And it's it is voluntary credits uh, with respect to, to agriculture. So it's um, more to encourage the sequestration of carbon in, in, in the soil through um, probably strip-till type of, or, or uh, 
strip till type of practices. Uh, so I know there's a big discussion, you know, with, with Secretary Vilsack around the USDA and how that could tie to agriculture right now. So there's a lot of discussions um, going along with that. Um, I, I again just think if we were to uh, have a regulatory, have some agency with regulatory oversight on the um, legitimacy that that would add value to a market. And I maybe just asked the same question to you twice, but that's <laughs> your thoughts on that. No, Mr. Chairman and Representative Greer, yes, yes, I agree. Uh, we, we did we did look at Stabenow's bill and, and it, it did apply broadly to, to ranching and other activities in Wyoming. Otherwise, we would have shot up a flare and said someone needs to, um, maybe intervene there, and that bill, that legislation, does stand for the for the idea of a governmental agency here, the Department of Agriculture, playing a significant role, running the voluntary carbon market in that in in that instance. So yes, I, I will agree with you again. I think there are are opportunities here to be pursued, and again, I will say it's great foresight for for the Wyoming legislature. Uh, I mean, I'm here because 12 years ago the legislature passed those forward-looking carbon capture and storage laws. So this would be consistent with the next frontier of that type of forward-looking thinking, looking at markets. Representative Burkhart, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Coddington, is there any chance you could say, put your presentation notes into just a paper for us? I can only write so fast, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Chairman and Representative Burke, I, I, I do apologize. I, I think maybe I took a speech uh, talking class at some point in life, but yes, and I apologize for not submitting written testimony in advance. I just could not meet the deadline, but I will convert my uh, written comments into a paper and submit them for the record. Thank you. Uh, Representative Westford. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Conan, thanks so much for your time. Uh, you mentioned that there isn't any kind of standing methodology for, for sailing, if I heard that correctly. Correct. It's because my knowledge is deeply lacking in that area. Could you maybe just give a, a brief overview of what that would broadly entail, and what that would look like? So Mr. Chairman and, and Representative Western, yes. And actually um, what it would, the comparable methodology for uh, generating voluntary credits via EOR runs about hundred pages. Uh, and again, I drafted some of that about a decade ago, and it talks about the technical aspects, how to manage the field, verification, and on and on and on. And so to do the comparable methodology for sailing storage, I think we would just start with the, that CO2 EOR document and tweak it for um, sailing approaches now cognizant of the class six rules. So that existing EOR methodology would provide a really good running start for the sailing, a potential sailing one. Follow up? No? Representative Bear. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Uh, Coddington, I heard you say that uh, the methodology would be, uh, require some energy uh, and effort to be able to produce carbon credits. And so I just wanted you to kind of expand on that idea a little bit. When, when I look at agriculture, there's already a methodology there. It's already happening. Um, can that not be used for carbon credits in the, in the scenario that you're describing? Mr. Mr. Chairman and Representative Bayer, yes. Although again, those methodologies are by project type. So if, if you had an agricultural project that fit within the defined bounds of whatever that existing methodology is, you could use it. There will be new project types where a methodology does not exist, one of which is sailing storage of CO2 EOR, and there then you would have to go out and create that document. Um, and that would take some time and and money. Generally, a registry would be involved in that. Uh, there would be public comment on it. So this is an open and transparent process. So it could not be, the outcome could not be uh, 
predicted in advance, but, um, but yes, there are certainly lots of methodologies out there that apply to a variety of project types that would enable you to generate and sell voluntary carbon credits today. The uh, a question I have is, uh, I, I, there's 3.3 million tons of CO2 a year from dry fork station. If we were to sequester all that, either EORI or whatever we do with it, how many credits, how many carbon credits do we get for that? Do we get 3.3 million or we get one? In theory, you would get, Mr. Chairman, um, you would get one credit per each ton oh. stored. And then, th then you'd have to determine what the market value of that is. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Other questions? And I, I, I'm thinking that Sarah has more. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I have a little bit more. <laughs> oh. oh, sorry. Trey has a question for you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you mentioned briefly that there are three projects in Wyoming that are um, voluntarily getting credits. Can you shed any more light onto those projects? Um, yes, Mr. Chairman and Representative Sherwood, and I'll, these will be provided in my uh, the version of the written comments that I provide. And again, I'm this is all publicly available information. Interestingly enough, they all appear to be CO2 EOR based projects. Um, and again, I'm going blind. Uh, one is by Merit Energy. Uh, one looks to be at the Manal field and one is at Salt Creek. And actually now that I read it, all three of them are completed. Um, and I believe all of them were CO2 EOR based projects. And quite frankly, I think using the methodology I helped to write. So, um, but that'll be in the written comments. All right, thank you. Sarah, take it away. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So um, uh, just to, to um, kind of give you a little bit more background about why the Business Council is looking at this, you know, this, um, uh, this came across our desk um, because we were seeing an increasing number of companies um, in Wyoming uh, who are, you know, developing technologies to capture CO2, um, create products from using CO2 and things like that. Um, and so that's really how we got into this um, and started looking at these markets and looking and understanding how, how we can help these companies be most successful. Um, and, and that really led us down the path toward voluntary markets. Um, a little bit about voluntary markets and why those are something interesting at this moment in time. Um, the, those markets are driven by two related but um, separate things. The first is environment, social, and governance investment. And that's what's called ESG investing um, that Kip, Kip uh, uh, mentioned in his testimony. Um, I, and this, and you've probably heard of that. Um, I, but wanted to touch on that a little bit because um, of the market opportunity that we see there. Uh, analysts predict that to be um, a, a growing market. It's predicted to be about 53, but worth about $53 trillion by the end of this year. Um, and so growing really quickly. And that's really what's driving the, um, uh, the, the demand for CO2 credits um, from corporations who are setting corporate sustainability goals. That's the second but related thing. Corporations are, are setting corporate sustainability goals to take advantage of that uptick in ESG investment and that interest from Wall Street. So this is really being market driven. Nobody's telling these companies, you know, you have to go buy these credits or um, you, you need to reduce your, your carbon footprint or anything like that. This is being driven by the market. Um, and we see that there is a, a potential market opportunity for companies in Wyoming to take advantage of that market opportunity. Um, and so that's why we kind of came, that's how we came to this um, to this kind of problem. And it sounds like Chairman Greer and Representative Baer kind of came to it th through a similar um, I, I kind of thought process, looking at this as a, as a potential emerging market opportunity for Wyoming companies. Um, so, it, it, 
so we've we've come to it by that. Um, we've also learned really quickly that these are very, very complex. There's a lot of different stakeholders at the table um, that all have really dynamic um, interactions among them. And so if you go to the next slide, I'll talk about the approach that we're taking. Um, because this is so complex, because there are so many people um, that, you know, all the way from agriculture to energy to technology to banks, um, that these markets bring together, we're taking this really iterative and exploratory approach. So um, we're, we're starting by really understanding each one of those perspectives really deeply. So far, we've talked to about 40 individuals and groups, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about what we've learned so far in a second. Um, but in all of those conversations, we're really asking two questions. One, is there something that the state of Wyoming either capital S or lowercase s, could do to, um, to help the, the players in these markets. So, and B, is there, what is that value proposition if there is one? So we're really trying to explore, you know, whether there is something that we could do and then, and then what that could be if so. Um, if we do find, you know, as we're, we're continuing these conversations and that as we do, if we do find that there is a, a value proposition that we can offer, um, what we plan to do is to continue to involve stakeholders in, in developing potential policy or programmatic solutions, um, and then test and refine those to whatever extent possible um, to make sure that we're avoiding any um, unintended consequences since these are so complex and have so many players involved in them. Um, this was our plan even before uh, we realized it was going to be an interim topic um, uh, for this committee. And so we'd be happy to work with the committee in, in whatever way um, makes sense with, with our um, with collaboratively. So, Mr. Chairman. Yes. So with this being an interim topic, that means mm -hmm. uh, we're going to work it hard for the next six months. Yep. And, and come to a solution. Are you guys ready for that? Mr. Chairman, I, I would say yes, we are. <laughs> would you agree, Mr. Coddington? <laughs> Representative Bear has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I apologize, Ms. Fitzgerald, that we were not able to communicate beforehand, just busy life this time of year. But uh, one of the things I'd like to know in the 40 individuals and stakeholders I certainly have a concern, but you've already mentioned that we're not looking to create a cap and trade in the state of Wyoming. Um, and I want to support our coal industry and our coal fired power plants. And so I want to ensure that we're including them as stakeholders as well. If there's an opportunity for them to stave off some sort of requirement in the future or, uh, or to benefit from this research and potential legislation. I, I would certainly want them to be involved with what we're doing as we go forward. Has that been something of your effort so far? Mr. Chairman, Representative Bear, we haven't talked to that specific stakeholder group yet, but I agree with you that needs to be something that we include in, in our, our efforts going forward. And I will say that we have talked to oil and gas companies who are, who are interested. Good. All right, if we go on to the next slide, I can talk a little bit about what we have learned um, so far. And I won't read this. This is very small. It's in your materials. You can take a look at it there. Um, but the main takeaway that we've gathered from these stakeholders is that, yes, there is an opportunity in voluntary CO2 markets, um, but there are some challenges and uh, in terms of accessing those markets as efficiently as, as they might be able to. Um, and those really stem from kind of the consistency and efficiency um, uh, that, that these voluntary markets um, kind of lack. Um, and, and Kip did a great job of, of explaining kind of how voluntary markets work. Um, and that, that consistency, you know, goes back to, to Kip's um, explanation of how these work. And right now they're working exactly as they were designed to. Um, there are many different exchanges. If you want to sell a CO2 credit or buy a CO2 credit, you can go to one of those exchanges. Um, as Kip said, you know, do that currently if you've if you're using one of their approved methodologies, or you can endeavor to create your own methodology, or you could 
try to create your own exchange. Um, I, um, but what we've, we've observed from a business standpoint, at least, and, and as we've been talking to several stakeholders so far, is that, um, that uh, each one of these each one of these exchanges defines CO2 differently, um, a CO2 credit differently, rather. Um, and so what that means is that if you're a buyer or a seller of a CO2 credit, it, it creates some challenges. That means that these, these uh, credits aren't traded across different exchanges. They're only sold as kind of boutique packaged products rather than more like a commodity as you might kind of think of a material like CO2. Um, and what that means is that um, if you're trying to sell a CO2 credit, like Kip said, it can be kind of time consuming. It can be a long process. It can be really hard. There's just a lot of barriers to selling a CO2 credit. And if you're a buyer of a C of CO2 credits, um, it can be hard to tell if you're getting a fair price for those. And that's that, that price transparency that Kip talked about. Um, what we've also learned um, from stakeholders so far is that there's, there's a lot to consider when you think about um, creating any sort of solution to that consistency problem. Um, the, the way that you measure these, um, uh, measure CO2 reductions is really complex and always changing. Um, and that's because there's a lot of science involved. There's a lot of science that hasn't been done yet um, that, that is involved as well. And new technologies are being developed all the time. And so that that kind of you know definition or or methodology, uh, all those need to be updated constantly. Um, another complexity which we've kind of hit on is the the um, uh, the policy landscape is changing quickly. We've got kind of bills waiting in the wings at the federal level. Um, different states are looking at different bills too, and so that creates some more complexity. Um, but I think the biggest um, uh, you know, the challenge that we're going to have to overcome if we want to address this is just the fact that there are so many um, players in this market, um, and we need to make sure that um, that that the market works for all of them and not just a subset of them. If we if we do create something that works for one particular industry or one particular technology, we run the risk of actually exacerbating that consistency tech problem rather than solving it. And so um, that's a big one. And then last but not least is um, I talked about the kind of public sector landscape changing quickly, um, but uh, entities like banks um, and their private sector ta task forces, the private sector is also looking at solving this consistency problem. Um, and so um, making sure that, that we're working with the private sector and, and complementary to whatever efforts um, they're doing is really, really important piece too. And um, with that, you know, that complexity is, if you want to go to the next slide, it's a repeat slide. Um, uh, but that complexity is really the reason that, um, that we've been taking this kind of iterative process and really trying to understand stakeholder holder needs. And um, uh, I'll stop there and answer any questions if you have them. I, I have a question on that egg community one where they're planting their uh, plants that use CO2, isn't that kind of like that, that they were required to do it and it's just one year, it isn't in for perpetuity. Uh, it doesn't that disqualify them for credits? So it, it depends, right? So it, it I'll, uh, Kip will probably do a better job at answering this, but uh, Mr. Chairman, um, this comes back to that concept of additionality um, that Kip talked about. So if an ag producer is required to make some sort of CO2 reductions, um, they would have to go above and beyond whatever that requirement was to capture additional CO2 credits. Okay, other questions? Yeah, Representative Brewer. Probably more of a comment on that. Um, you know, we all we all know plants uh, use use CO two, and then they they'll sequester what they don't use into the soil. 
And so when the soil is disturbed, that CO2 is released. But if you have different farming practices, such as snow-till, where you go back in on your stubble, um, then that, that CO2 stays sequestered. And I've seen modeling examples, um, you know, through the ice states you look at, you know, down the Red River Valley and around the bend of, uh, in May, CO2 levels increasing. And that's because of the tilling practices and some of that being released. So that's some of that focus is a change in practice. Also that practice reduces the number of trips over the field. So you're burning less diesel uh, to, to raise a crop. So there are factors in that. But um, my opinion, uh, no-till cannot uh, also leads to other issues. And so it, you're, you're correct. At some point in time, you will have to come in and clean up your fields and then go back to practice. So, yeah. Wouldn't you agree? <laughs> Sorry. I, <laughs> no worries. <laughs> Senator. Senator Cooper, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as a producer, a uh, ag producer or oil and gas producer or whatever it may be, <clears throat> reduces their CO2 uh, emissions and, and creates hopefully some credits, who verifies those credits? How, how do they say, okay, I got one? Somebody's got to say that this is a real thing. Who is that? Um, yeah, I can take a crack at that, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Um, uh, Senator Cooper, thank you. Uh, uh, so there are a number of third-party verifiers, um, and and uh, uh, there are kind of a few that have the most kind of credibility, legitimacy, I'd say, and Kip mentioned those in his testimony. Um, I, I, but what we've observed, or at least what I've observed in, in talking to folks so far is, um, is that those third-party verifiers, they're, they're standalone you know, uh, 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 verification bodies. Um, you, and then there are other exchanges that can operate outside of those third-party verifiers too. And so since this is, this is a voluntary market, there's no kind of, um, there's no, uh, um, there's no kind of one entity that says, this is what a CO2 credit is. Um, you know, the, the, the biggest purchases of CO2 credits rely on kind of these three or four, um, I, I'd say most kind of credible uh, third party verifiers. Kip's going to do a better job at answering that, I think. <laughs> Any follow up, Senator Cooper? No. Okay. No. Yeah. Representative Greer has a so, question. Well, I'm trying to drive the conversation, um, obviously, like a Mack truck. Um, <laughs> so if, if we had um, if we had a statutory uh, structure with an agency, so take DQ. Okay? And uh, we've got uh, definitions of what a carbon offset is, or at least statutorily define the process of how that would be done through rulemaking. And then we establish, at least in Wyoming, a, a, a statutorily recognized, even if it was through rules, um, offset and a series of offsets. Okay. Um, and, and, and that's, that is to be verified. Uh, through, through, I'll just say DEQ again, uh, and then open up that opportunity for individual banks to come in and apply um, to, to be registered in Wyoming under a certain set of criteria, obviously. Is that a framework that would work? Is that a framework then that would open up and bring validity and value to carbon offsets in the state of Wyoming that would again, stimulate this technology we're trying to move forward to, to uh, for various reasons. But, you know, we all come back to, um, if we can get to carbon capture and, and uh, continue our coal industry and make us happy, but there's other, other things, other benefits as well. Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll uh, answer that. And then I, I, I'd like uh, Mr. Connington to weigh in on that. That's kind of one of the hypotheses, hypotheses that we're looking at um, is kind of a, um, 
not a definition or and not a suite or a set of definitions for what a CO2 credit is necessarily, but maybe uh, defining a process for how an entity could um, could get their methodology, their definition verified by the state of Wyoming um, to make sure that it was kind of dynamic and worked with the private sector. Um, with that said, um, we you know we really haven't done all of we haven't done all of the outreach I think that's necessary to make sure that that would be something that wouldn't cause an unintended consequence some, somewhere down the line. Um, but I would say that that's something, an avenue that we could explore for sure. And Mr. Chairman and Representative Greer, yes, I would, I would think that's really interesting. And that's interesting to root that potentially in DEQ. Um, and then similar to what Ms. Uh, Ms. Fitzgerald said initially, there would be other stakeholders that would have to be at that table. Um, but if this was done through a rulemaking process, some of those would, would arrive. Um, and, and again, obviously we can't speak, speak for DEQ, but I do remember enough of environmental law and under some of these environmental statutes, wetlands, for example, there are banking programs for preservation of wetlands and swapping wetlands. Um, so there, there are uh, precedents for this type of market mechanisms in, in environmental statutes. So yes, I would agree with Ms. Fitzgerald. That's definitely is something to be investigated further. Yes. Representative Berker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So uh, looking at our coal industry, the majority of Wyoming coal is burned outside of Wyoming by a long shot. With a way to handle the carbon, is it possible to do this in a way that those power plants that, and there was a map up earlier that literally are all over the country can take advantage of what we do here um, while it would benefit, you know, the power plants in the state, the real benefit comes in, I think, if you can benefit uh, some of those states that 40% of their power is from Wyoming coal. Uh, can we do that? Can we, can we build a, could we build a system that allows them to take advantage of what we do here? So, uh, Mr. Chairman and Representative Burkhart, um, yeah, so speaking personally on that, on that issue, so, and, and you are right, because we're exporting all of this energy, it really matters more what's going on outside of our borders and where our customers are. So I have two thoughts on that. It would first depend, upon, it, that would most likely be most efficiently implemented through a federal program, which might be complicated. I, I, I will note, and this uh, this is interesting. So under the, so the, there were different sets of rules that would regulate greenhouse gas emissions from the existing coal fleet. The first was the clean power plan, and that was replaced by the affordable clean energy rule. And now both of those are stalled. What was interesting about the clean power plan is the clean power plan allowed outside the fence controls. So arguably the, key, the clean power plan would have allowed a power plant to go out and, and purchase um, by compliance, if you will, as opposed to bringing all that compliance down on its own stack. So I think it would be interesting to see what the Biden administration does, if anything, on a replacement for the affordable clean energy rule. And this might be construed as putting a dress on a pig, excuse my French, but if there were market flexibilities put into that program, um, that I think would be, would be worth talking about. Although once you open that door, you're conceding those controls. So this is all complicated, but yes, I think there are approaches there as well. You done? You're done? Wow. Are there questions for Mr. Connington or Ms. Fitzgerald? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So where do we go from here? What's our next step? What do we need to be doing? 
Mr. Chairman, thanks, Representative Burkhart. Um, I would say that we we would like to continue doing that outreach to different stakeholders. Um, we we know we have more to talk to, um, and then start to design whatever that kind of framework looks like together with those for those stakeholders. Follow up, Mr. Chairman. Yes. So do we that design and all of that? Do we have the ability to do that? Call it in house in the state, or should we be looking at contracting some of this out. It sounds like a very complex process, and I think this is one we need to get it right uh, as early on as we can. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, Rep Representative Burkhart, um, I, I, I don't think it would hurt to add some kind of consultative power to the team, um, for sure. Um, I, and in addition to that, you know, something else that could catalyze and accelerate this process is um, trying to team up with other task forces that are looking at this. There's um, something called the Task Force for Scaling Voluntary Carbon Markets that is um, uh, at the national level it's being driven by the private sector and um, and I, I'm just exchanging emails with somebody from from that group uh, currently and uh, they're looking at exactly the same problem um, but that again it's private sector led um, and so we we might be able to benefit from you know all of the outreach and all of the work and all of the research that they've already done um, to inform what solutions we may be able to bring to the table in Wyoming. And Representative Greer, let me ask you a more pointed question. How far along can we be on August 11th when we convene in Laramie? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I, I believe we can bring a really frameworky bill draft to you, got, to you on, um, on August 11th. Um, again, caveated with there's potential risks and in, in unintended consequences with this. So we can have, a, we can have a, something to work off of. So, I guess so Mr. Chairman, yes. yeah, you know, so with the work, I mean, the experts sitting to the your right, uh, definitely. Mr. Well, Mr. Chairman and Representative Greer, we're we're both uh, t teammates, and there's lots of expertise in the room, but but certainly we're prepared to move expeditiously on this. And again, there's lots of materials from which frameworks can be drawn, so we're not reinventing the wheel here. Very good. I just, Mr. Chairman, I just don't want to. I don't want to study this to death. Okay. Right. Burkhart's got that look in his eye like he's got a question. That's one. Oh, okay. All right. No other questions for the, the team. Thank you for your input. Thank you for, for coming today. Team. They're a team, yeah. Yeah, they are. <laughs> Okay, uh, <laughs> let's see. We have some public comment. I think we have, do we have some public comment in-house here? Mr. Chairman, uh, John Robitaille, I am the CEO of Encore Green Environmental, also the director of the Carbon Asset Network. Uh, today, I'm, I'm going to put on the Carbon Asset Network hat and discuss with you uh, what a Wyoming company is already doing. Uh, we are a, a Wyoming agriculture company, and we are in the voluntary carbon capture market. What we do is, is we take soil samples uh, in agricultural operations and we take a baseline of that soil sample. Then we improve the soil in some way. What that may be, may be uh, additional fertilizer. Uh, it may be uh, a no-till drill, as Mr. Chairman spoke of. Uh, it may be implementing mob grazing. Whatever it may be, it improves that soil so that the plant population comes in and increases such that the carbon capture in the soil is increased. We come back to that same spot we took that soil sample from before and take it again a year later. Then we measure the soil organic carbon. I can tell you precisely how much soil, how much carbon is captured in that soil. When we, when we talk about exchanges, uh, I wanna caution you 
uh, a friend of mine and a friend of all of yours who uh, ranches in Buffalo, had to move to Cheyenne because of a job, uh, worked with an exchange years ago, and that exchange took 50% right off the top of what he was going to receive. We had a discussion with him about what we were doing. Uh, his response was, I don't like this 50%. Our model, we, we take donations to a, a, a 501c3, a nonprofit. That donation then is passed on to the Carbon Asset Network, which 70 cents on the dollar is then passed back to the landowner in our program. That 70 cents on the dollar is then used for uh, whatever uh, whatever implementation we may come up with, uh, we do use a certified agronomist to uh, speak with the landowner to come up with an idea that will work to improve their soil. Uh, and that certified agronomist also uses uh, he's also our uh, soil scientist who goes out and takes the takes the measurements. Those soil samples are then sent to a, a certified laboratory which are then uh, put on our website through uh, blockchain, as, as you mentioned previously. Uh, I, I wanna explain to you why, why we think this is very important. Uh, rangeland is, an, is a critical sink. It's a critical carbon sink. It's, it's one of the largest carbon sinks out there. Wyoming is full of rangeland. We're trying to find a way to work with uh, Wyoming state lands. Uh, it could be a revenue source for them. Uh, we're trying to, uh, I'm, I'm encouraged by Mr. Coddington's uh, remarks because I have, I have hit brick walls every time I go to the University of Wyoming for, for help on this. Uh, I am uh, also wanting to, uh, to share with you, there's a, there was a paper written uh, by Justin Derner with the USDA uh, down at the research station in Cheyenne. Uh, his study showed 19 million metric tons of carbon could be captured in rangeland. If, if, we can, if we can do this, if we can make it work, rangeland in Wyoming could become a serious boon for this, uh, for this, uh, this market. Years ago, um, I believe it was in the early 2000s, uh, Representative Huckfelt ran a bill to, uh, to create a study. And to my knowledge, uh, the only two of us on that committee that, that remain are uh, uh, Director Parfit and myself. Uh, we have uh, tried in vain to find that, uh, that report. Uh, we cannot find it, but it was, it was very detailed. It was a very good report. It went into a lot of information. I, if you're looking at uh, legislation, uh, perhaps the LSO has that report buried somewhere uh, under a paperweight. It may be uh, helpful to review if you have time to do so. Uh, one other thing I'd, I'd like to mention, uh, our, our program is designed for ESG. Uh, we're, we're hoping to keep coal mines running. We're hoping to keep oil wells drilling. Uh, and we're, we're doing this through, through ranching operations so that our ranchers can continue to ranch. We can continue to sell beef. Uh, we believe we have a very good operation and uh, I'm willing to answer any questions and, and uh, fill any details that you may have. Thank you, sir. Questions for Mr. Robotay. Questions for Mr. Robotay. Representative Greer. Yeah, no, thanks for your testimony and, and uh, insight. Yeah, yeah, lost studies seem to be a problem when you get past 10 years. Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, Mr. Um, Chairman. My question is, is um, so your sale of the, of the credits go to what, what, what type of customers are, are buying those credits right now? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, so, so our nonprofit is open to anyone. Uh, it's open to any industry, any business, any individual. Uh, what we're looking for, we're looking for $30 an acre. We believe that, uh, that as an individual, uh, if, if, uh, if you've noticed on some of your plane tickets lately, it says you spent X number of carbon, you know. Uh, and, and so we really feel that, that uh, this is becoming an issue, particularly with the younger people. Uh, if, we, if we think about millennials, the, the, some of the oldest millennials are, are 40 years old now. 
uh, which uh, makes me feel a little bit old, but, uh, but, but their whole life they've been told, we're in a climate crisis. We need to do something. You need to sort your trash. You need to ride your bike. You need to, you need to come to our protest. You know, big oil, we got to protest those guys. What else can they do? This is an opportunity. You can, you can help capture carbon through soil health. And we can do that for you. We can help you with that. We, we, we picked that number 30, Mr. Chairman, uh, particularly because uh, we feel that a, a $30 credit on your credit card every month would, would end up as $360 a year. That, that $30, as we, as we said, 70% of that goes back to the landowner to implement programs that will help improve their, their soil capture potential. That's huge for these guys. I uh, spoke to one rancher the other day that said, you know, I'd be thrilled to have a dollar. I've, I've, got, a, I've got a young man in our program. He, uh, he ranches on the border of uh, Laramie and, uh, and uh, Platte counties. He has, uh, he himself has about 900 deeded acres. He's in a, he's in a conglomerate with the family. They, they all told have about 20,000, I believe. Uh, and he wants to improve things. He wants to do something, but he can't go to the bank with his 900 acres and he can't get a loan big enough to do anything with that 900 acres. And the whole group won't want to, didn't want to participate. So how does he, how does he improve his operation? How does he improve his, not only his, his grazing operation, but also his soil capture potential. He's in our program to do just that. We're working with, uh, with some national groups on, uh, in order to get funding. Uh, we're, uh, we're also partnering with the Wyoming Stock Growers Association. Uh, and we believe this is, a, this is a really significant program that can really help a lot of people and, and really grow our, our state's economy through, uh, through not only putting additional people to work and sales tax, but also potentially with, uh, with something with state lands, if we can get something worked out with them. Answer your question. Representative Burkhart, do you have a question? No? Okay. Don doesn't want to ask about fishing or anything? Yeah, I guess I guess no, they guess not. I guess they're hungrier than I thought. I, I suppose they are. I, thank you for your time and I apologize for being a little long-winded there. Thank you, Mr. Robotai. No, thank you, you were so good. Much. You were good. Anybody else uh, in the audience for public comment? Anybody else in the audience for public comment? I think we have one on the on the virtual for public comment. <clears throat> Can you bring him up? There he is. So Jim couldn't drive up here no. to join us. He doesn't want to waste fuel. Mr. McGagna, are you are you are you ready to comment on the carbon credits? I am Mr. Chairman and appreciate the opportunity. Jim McGagan with the Wyoming Stock Workers Association. I appreciate the opportunity to follow Mr. Robitaille. Uh, we as, a, as an organization representing the ranch community in Wyoming have partnered with Mr. Robitaille and the Carbon Asset Network from the beginning uh, for a couple of reasons, frankly. Uh, one is that obviously uh, we see this as the potential to become a significant revenue source for those of our members who implement good practices. And I, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, I know your co-chairman spoke about croplands, but I appreciate Mr. Robitaille also brought up the tremendous potential in rangelands in Wyoming, grazing lands. And that's uh, a significant, the major part of our focus certainly is, is in that area. So we see the potential there that this is a revenue source that can help maintain the viability economically of our uh, family farms and ranches in the state. At the same time, it's very helpful in portraying these ranches as people who care about the environment, who care about uh, the impacts that carbon may be having uh, on our environment, on our climate, and are willing to be uh, responsive to that. And as, as many of you I'm sure are aware, uh, not unlike the coal industry, we receive a lot of attacks on our industry 
uh, particularly the the methane that is supposedly emitted by our cows, et cetera, and, and those who would get rid of cows off of the rangelands. Uh, we see this as an opportunity to be able to demonstrate that we can actually have a positive impact. And uh, when carbon is stored, uh, carbon has a long life when it's in the atmosphere. Methane, while there may be some emissions from cattle, although we think current practices in the US minimize that, uh, methane has a much shorter uh, scientific life, so to speak. So therefore, uh, it can be justified more easily if we're in fact contributing to carbon sequestration. Uh, other thing I would mention is, you know, had this been 20 years ago, uh, we probably wouldn't be sitting at the table with this, but the, the technology on soil health and management of soils has advanced so significantly in the last uh, two decades that uh, we don't just turn animals out and graze the land today, that many of our people are heavily involved in applying the science of soil technology and plant health to their grazing operations. And this sequestration of, of carbon uh, ties right in there. Um, Mr. Chairman, I know that the legislation that passed the Senate, Senator Stabenow's legislation has been mentioned. Just a brief comment on that. Uh, we have not opposed that, but we're not uh, excited to embrace it. It's kind of a middle ground. Uh, it actually directs the U U.S. Department of Agriculture to become involved in establishing some criteria for measurement of carbon credits and, and carbon sequestration. Uh, but it then goes on to put some parameters on that, that it has to be done in consultation with the ag industry, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if there are going to be some some parameters put in place, we are much more inclined to support the state of Wyoming doing that through any work that your committee might undertake than we are in having it done at the federal level. So uh, we're, we're not particularly anxious to see that move forward at this point in time and do believe that there is an opportunity for the state to step forward and uh, assume a leadership uh, role in this. Um, I think not unlike what we did with sage grouse and maybe more recently with the governor's executive order on migration corridors, that there's a way for the for state, the state of Wyoming to play a, an important role, but a limited role and not uh, assume a role that interferes with the creativity and the flexibility that exists in the private sector for this, whether it's for agriculture or any other purposes. Uh, so with that, Mr. Chairman, in the interest of time and your lunch hour, I would just say that uh, if the committee decides to move forward with uh, drafting a bill or that, we would welcome the opportunity to be engaged with you and, and work on something that uh, can complement existing programs such as the Carbon Asset Network and put Wyoming in a leadership position on this issue. With that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Any questions? Any questions? Representative Burkhart. Oh, no, no. Okay. <laughs> Senator Cooper. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. McDagna, uh, you're, you're asking, would we be interested in, in uh, drafting a bill? A bill to do what? What, what would it actually do? And, and you know, what kind of direction do we need to go on that? Mr. Chairman, Senator Cooper, uh, I'm not prepared today to offer any specifics, but I think my, my vision of if there were to be a bill would be that it would, it would be crafted in such a way that it provides, a, maybe I would say a blessing for the private sector initiatives and put some parameters out there to assure that those initiatives fall within a wide array perhaps of categories, but that are credible and defensible, uh, but, but is quite open in terms of allowing the opportunity for that creativity and the fact that whether we're dealing with rangelands or coal mines or whatever other factors are out there that, that there's no one size fits all approach here. Uh, I think we asked the business council to come back with a draft for carbon credits. So you can probably work with them to uh, get all your input into that too. 
<clears throat> Mr. Chairman, we'd be pleased to do that. We work closely with the Business Council in other areas involving agriculture and, and have not been engaged on this issue, but would welcome the opportunity to become engaged with them. Okay, any other questions? I just a quick oh, yeah. yeah, so just a quick comment. And so Jim, you couldn't drive up here to join us, huh? <laughs> uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I could have. I, I chose not to today because I knew your time was tight and I'm actually trying to finish some work here so I can head off to my own ranch for two or three days and do some honest work. Okay. Well, it's so I, I think what's what is important as we were discussing, Senator Cooper, is that, you know, we find a framework that that brings validity to it. But again, that we have the flexibility uh, in and that we don't create the bank, we let the banks be able to operate within that to make sure that they've got, again, the validity and the value associated with those credits. And I think as we think about this, that's how we need to, to do that again. Same thing like we did with sage grouse. We, we, we put some parameters up there, but we, we let those banks develop when it already developed anyway. But, and so, and, and so Jim, yeah. So my wife is worried about rangeland. I am focused on row crops for the record. Okay. I understand and respect that. Other questions or comments, questions or comments hearing none. Thank you, Mr. McGagna, for being with us today, and thank you for saving that carbon, carbon from your car. <laughs> well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I most likely will be with you in person if this is on your agenda for your August 11th meeting. Okay. All right. Thank you. Is there any other public comment? Any other public comment? No? Not online, Mr. Chairman. Okay. All right. All right. We'll close public comment then, and we have... Uh, some things to do. I got down. Uh, Heiner's got a bill draft. So, Mr. Chairman, um, yeah, we had uh, Representative Heiner had uh, broached a bill that had um, regarding the Industrial Siting Council. It went went through the Senate, passed House Minerals, uh, did not make it to the floor. Uh, and I know he has visited with the director and with uh, Luke Esch with the Industrial Siting Council. And I just think uh, if we want to revisit that, uh, it'd be kind of good to get a nod from the whole committee. So, okay, Representative Heiner, you want to tell us about that so, bill and see? We'll probably have to vote on it. Yeah. The senator from Gillette will make us vote on it. <laughs> thank you thank you mr chairman i would like to propose that we uh bring senate file 82 back for consideration by the committee this passed uh, the senate 27 to 3 in 2021 session and it passed the house minerals by eight to one uh but it didn't have time to be debated on the floor and we ran out of time a similar bill house bill 237 was uh was brought before the House in 2020, uh, and it passed 50 to 7, but was not brought up in the Senate. So there's there's broad support in both chambers, and I think there's a, a there may be a possibility of treating this during the budget cycle because it would reduce expenses for and of our general fund in tens of millions of dollars. So it does affect our revenue and uh, might help our budget cycle. So I would propose that we bring this forward to the committee next time we meet. And so we can discuss and, and tweak it, refine it a little bit. So your motion is to uh, bring Senate file 82 to the committee for the next meeting to approve it for, for one of our bills. Yes, sir. Is there a second? Second down, uh, Cooper, se second, Senator Cooper. Any discussion? Any discussion? Mr. Any, Chairman? Any, oh, yeah. Yes. Representative. For the sponsor, could you remind us what is in that bill? I, I considering we had 400 some, just the number doesn't do a lot for me. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Representative Bur Burkhart, uh, that was the revisions to the uh, Industrial Siting Committee, whereby the, the percentage allowed to be uh, for unmitigated impacts was dropped from 2.79 down to 2%. Any other questions? Other questions? 
All, all in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. I think that narrowly passed. So bring a bill next time, Representative Heiner. Uh, Chairman, one other thing, if, if I may propose something. Just one. Okay. I would, and I've talked to uh, Chairman Greer about this, but I would also request that the LSO uh, do a comparison with other states in our area about what they do for unmitigated impacts from large industrial uh, projects in their states. So we can maybe learn from some others and see if we're doing the right thing with, with our industrial siting act. We might, we might want to tweak that a little bit based on what others are doing. I think the chairman can just Bear. direct that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to bring up another subject, if I may. Uh, let's let's address that one yeah, first. Uh, yes, yeah, so Mr. Co-Chair, we've got these other subjects lined up. We'll, we'll knock these out. The chairman can direct LSO to do that research. And so, uh, Representative Heiner, we have no problems with that. So, And Mr. Chairman, just so I'm clear, Representative Heiner, uh, the, the research you're looking for is a comparison of what other states do for local, like the impact assistance payments for yeah. unmitigated impacts? Exactly. Okay. Yes. Okay. All right. And Mr. Go Chairman, ahead. yeah, I'm sorry, I'm trying to help co-chair out because uh, House members are busy. Yeah, they are. <laughs> uh, one is, is we've got uh, a couple of ideas that we'd like to see some initial bill drafts come out of uh, our discussion with the Business Council, and I, that's where Representative Bear is going, I believe. But before we go to that, uh, Mr. Fuller, did you happen to take a list of our action items for the Business Council? I was chairing and I did not write them down. Mr. Chairman, I've got, I think, most of those points in my notes. Okay, and I think uh, the, the co-chair and I would just let, go ahead if you get a letter to us, uh, to them, a uh, copy to the committee so that we make sure we get some of those items back. I think we'd like to see that life cycle type of analysis on that Evanston project to be helpful for us for the effectiveness of BRC. So, okay, so with that. Representative Bear. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to bring a motion that we move forward on drafting a bill uh, having to do with the succession planning uh, funding through the challenge program, as was uh, recommended by the one business council earlier in our meeting. Second. Okay. Draft of and give me that again. What your the succession, succession planning? Or yes, it was. There was two issues there: succession, succession planning, and and one other. Yeah, there was uh, the one having to do with uh, projects, um, contract projects, succession loans. Yeah, succession loans. Succession is what I'm concerned with. Succession planning. Okay, Mr. Yes, uh, Senator. Roth. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I, I think there were four ish issues that could probably go into that same piece of legislation if we're going to make a request to draft for the next meeting. Uh, it might be prudent to have one draft with that series of recommendations all there so that we can see it drafted. And that's not to say that we all have to support all of the components. We can cross out, we can make the decision, but just from an LSO workload standpoint, uh, if we're gonna get one drafted for next time, I, I think we should just get all four of those recommendations drafted, assuming that, it, and again, it's, it's succession planning. There was an 80-20 shift um, on, on the bridge loan. Yeah, th there was the contract, uh, loan language and I, I feel like there was one more what was the one more that was the 8020 oh oh bridge loan challenge loan program it was 8020 bridge loan i'll just how how about this and if, if it's it's representative bearer's uh motion but Representative, would you be comfortable just having the, the co-chairs work with staff on making sure that we end up with a draft that, that recognizes all of those components of the recommendations, brings that back next time, and it would include that motion so that it's, it's just a little cleaner for staff? If, if you're comfortable with that, um, I think that would be handy. But again, uh, Representative, it's, it's your motion. So be my suggestion to just 
provide that flexibility for the co-chairs to work with with staff on capturing all of that. Mr. Chairman, I would be uh, amenable to that. Also, uh, I would recommend that we add the recapture uh, wording that we were locked, uh, discussing in the past as well. So maybe that would be that fourth item is the recapture. Uh, we, we had discussed uh, going back to some previous bills that uh, had covered that issue. Yep, and we can do that. That was a standalone bill, but yeah, that, that would be... Uh, we voted on that. We, we voted on that separately, didn't we? Yeah, so we yeah, that one's standalone. Yep, so it would be the others. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, With so that, we've it. modified that motion a little bit. Does everybody understand the motion? Yes. Everybody understands the motion? Uh, any more discussion? Wait, any more? Oh. Mr. Chairman, does yes. this motion include looking at changing the natural gas fueling infrastructure loan program to either make it broader to include charging stations in general or to identify electric and hydrogen charging stations? No, no, okay. it doesn't. So, so this would be that would need to be a separate. All right, I'll, separate I'm on standby. Thank you. Yes. Okay. All right. All right. Any other discussion? Any other discussion? Question, Question has been called. All in favor of Representative Bear's motion signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Did you want to make another motion on that uh, yes. issue? Mr. Chairman, I would like to make a motion um, to draft the bill that would edit the natural gas fueling infrastructure loan program to do away with natural gas and instead allow for electric or hydrogen charging stations. Uh, I, I, I don't like the wording of that to do away with the natural gas. I think in addition to the national gas. Yeah, yeah. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Rothfuss. Any discussion? Any discussion? Any discussion? Hearing none, sensing the body's ready to vote. All in favor, signify saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Somebody said no. Oh, one no. Okay. Any others? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So for the second meeting, I'd, I'd really like us to look at the originating statute for Wyoming Business Council and um, to frame that, you know, I, I had had some, a bill with some amendments to their originating statute. It was HB 110, uh, which would have added to that, to their originating statute that they would be also be promoting our low tax structure, our low taxes in the state of Wyoming. So I'd like to bring a motion to bring that back. And that could be used as a framework to look at uh, their originating statute and exactly what we're directing them uh, to do. Motion is to look at their originating uh, statute. The motion is to redraft, to bring back House Bill 110 from the 2021 session. Motion is to bring back House Bill 110 from the 2010 uh, to, to, to draft it, not to not for sponsorship, but to draft it. Is there a second? Is there a second? Second by by Representative Bear. Any discussion on redrafting House Bill 110? Any discussion? Any discussion? Hearing none, sensing the body's ready to vote. All in favor signify by saying aye. All opposed, same sign? No. no. Motion fails. We have a hand raise on that. Sure. Sure. All in favor of that motion, raise your, raise your hand. <clears throat> One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. All opposed, same. Raise your right hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight to four, it fails. Uh, okay. Now, and we got down the, the issues for the business council items. You have those items and know what we're going to request from them. Okay. All right. I don't have any other action items. Anybody uh, else? Mr. Chairman, can we just get a quick recap from LSO on their? Action items, please. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, um, Chairman Greer, we have um, a bill draft based on 2020 Senate File 100. Um, that was the bill concerning the um, the revenue recapture 
uh, for the BRC program, a bill draft um, based on the assigned trust concept uh, for reclamation bonding, a bill draft concerning poor space liability, except it's not gonna be called liability. Um, <laughs> Uh, Resurrect 2021 Senate File 82, which was the local impact assistance payment bill draft from last session. Um, research on what other area states do in terms of payments for unmitigated impacts. Um, a bill draft based on the business council, the various discussion for the amendments to those programs. A bill draft to amend the natural gas infrastructure loan program. Um, and, and then a letter, Mr. Chairman, from I believe the two of you to the business council with the items that the you know that the committee requested um, yesterday. Sounds right. Thank you. I think I think you got it. I think you got it. Anything else to come before the committee? I I promised you'd get out before six o'clock, and I I'm not going to miss it. Barely made it. Nice job. <laughs> barely. Barely. Nice. Barely. I would I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Uh, aye. All opposed, same sign. There are seven. Do you have time to do a lunch with panelists?